Hold on, buddy. Yeah. Here we go. It is. Here we go on YouTube. All right. Hey, YouTube, how y'all doing tonight? We're kicking off another night of exciting cryptid talk and one of my best friends in this field, the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, is back home. And yes, this is home for him because uh, when Ron was less busy, less important, less wanted by the supernatural society, he found a little home monthly here on Spaced Out Radio, and then he decided to become really popular, you know, and, you know, stroke his beard a little bit because he's got a fantastic beard, and say, hey, I can't do this anymore. I'm way too big for Spaced Out Radio now. Way, way too big. <laughs> oh, you're going to kill me, Ron, aren't you? You're going to kill me, aren't you? <laughs> I wish you could see the beard, though, my friend. It It is looking like a, a, a hearty mountain man's beard Beautiful. at this point. Because there's no salons open, so yeah. Beautiful. Keep it, it, it that way. It looks like I'm deep into playoff. It looks like I'm deep into playoff hockey. You know, it looks oh, like I have the yeah. playoff beard going on. Yeah, me too, man. Me too. I, I'm I'm like th- <laughs> I'm like third round beard right now. Third round beard. <laughs> hey, let's give it. A- oh, that's great. Let's give a shout out to everybody who's here so far. We got Tammy here. We got Jack. We got Waylon. We got Bigfoot, Michigan, Rob, Brett, Renee, Mala. How we all doing tonight? And uh, thank you so much for coming in. I know you guys are going to get really packed and jammed in there uh, in just a short amount of time. But I got to tell you, you know, there are very, very few people in this world, uh, this supernatural paranormal world that I think are of as quality of people and talent as Ronald Murphy. And if you haven't heard the crypto guru speak before, you guys are in for a real treat tonight. And you are going to be thanking me later to get a little bit of crypto guru love. And you're going to rush out, grab his books because he is that talented, that talented. Uh, Hey, Mogolan, how are you? Good to have you here. Thank you for coming on in and joining us as well. So, yeah, you guys are in for a treat. I really, really do appreciate this, Ronnie. Uh, And, you know, anytime you want to come on, I I quickly make room for you. Well, you do. I mean, I just texted you last week, as a matter of fact, and I said, I've got the Jones for some SOR. When can you hook me up with my fix? And you said, Ron, I can get you in next Tuesday. And I said, that's not soon enough, but you made it happen. So here I am. I know. I know. I felt bad. I felt bad. Hey, Donnie, I'm doing great tonight. How are you? Shanna Banana, much love. How are you doing? Yeah, man. It's all good, man. It is all, all good. And, And hey, Asteroid, this is always live, man. We're not Memorex anymore. You know, we were Dolby Digital Sound there for a while, but we are live, 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 live with the Crypto Guru tonight. It's just so much fun to be able to say Crypto Guru. Fuck yeah. It is. I I enjoy everything about it. I can't believe how that nickname that I gave you stuck, man. Everybody, no matter where you are, it's stuck. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, so uh, for the people that, that don't know, um, I'm uh, a guest uh, on uh, True Terror with Robert England on um, on the Travel Channel. It airs every Wednesday, uh, 10 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And uh, the producer actually went to the Travel Channel to see if they would be allowed to put Crypto Guru under my name. But they were afraid of stepping on some toes, so they couldn't do it. But actually, yeah, Hollywood wanted to put that moniker underneath my uh, my, my face in the caption. And uh, the powers that be over there at the network said no to it. I'm telling you, man, you got to trademark that. You have to trademark that. I, I, uh, you know? I and I, I, yes, and I, I, and I, I only want five percent. I only want five percent for coming up with it. <laughs> I, you know, I should have had you as an agent five years ago. Oh man, selling the crypto guru. All right, we're uh, we're under. Uh, we right. got about uh, forty five seconds here. Phenom, how you doing, man? Thanks for coming on in again. Appreciate that. We're gonna have a great show tonight. Great show for all of you. This is all. Every show is a great show, Dave. Oh. Uh, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> not, sometimes not, but thank you, Guru. I appreciate that. I really do. 
All right. Uh, uh-uh. I'm sending out the final tweet now. And we're about uh, 15 seconds away, my friend. 15 seconds, just counting down the blast off. Holy shit. The Bucks just got Gronkowski and Julian Edelman. Holy cow. Is that oh, true? Wow. Is that oh. true, Greco? Is that true? Wow. All right. Here we go. Music's on, Guru. Fucking Guru time. Here we go. I get all pumped up for this shit, man. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Here we go, buddy. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates across North America and digitally on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. If you want to take a listen to our archives, guess what? We have them free for you. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button when you go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. You can follow us on Twitter as well, at Spaced Out Radio for the show. My personal handle, at Dave Scott, S-O-R. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. You can rock out to Bumblefoot, read up on Captain Shirk's S-O-R Newswire, and much more. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. You know, I always get excited when this happens, man. I really do. The Crypto Guru is back where he belongs on Spaced Out Radio. Ronald Murphy is an historian, researcher, and a majestic writer when it comes to all things paranormal and cryptid. Ron is known as one of the top folklorists and legend seekers, as well as a paranormal investigator who delves into the legends to discover the facts. His on-book series is about everything weird and strange that can be found in bookstores across North America and on Amazon. He's had several television and documentary appearances over the last couple of years. His website is CryptoGuru.net. I'm taking credit for that, by the way. I am so taking credit for that. Then at the bottom of hour number three, I will bring you the SOR Newswire brought to you by Paranoia Magazine. CryptoGuru, it's always good when the children come back home and say hello to mom and dad. Man, <laughs> well, this is true because <laughs> this is the place where I started out, Dave. You're the first person that interviewed me after I put my book out, uh, The Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge, and uh, this is truly coming back home. I love it. I absolutely love it. And, and you know, Ron, there are very few people in this industry, and you know this from your time because you and I kind of entered it at the exact same time, very close. And you know as well as I do, because you've been on a learning curve much like I have. This is a this is a strange industry. And to find good friends like I consider you and you consider me is very, very difficult in this field, isn't it? Oh, it's extremely difficult. Um, I think the best way to look at this, the analogy to look at this, is almost like if you're dealing with, with the world of academia, because everybody is trying to find their particular niche, and it's, uh, it's the idea of publish or perish. You know, it really is. You have to come up with something new all the time, and sometimes that's a difficult thing. So people will, you know, jump on your back. They'll jockey for position. They'll use you in any which way that they can. They'll make you believe that they're your friend. And at the end of the day, you're left, you know, heartbroken. Look, I've been heartbroken a few times in this business with people that I thought were truly my friends, truly investigators, wanting to get to some sort of, you know, root of the truth that's going out there. And at the end, I feel, you know, myself, you know, I'm sitting there alone uh, with nothing to go on. Absolutely. What you said is absolutely true. Very few honest, genuine people in the field. And that's the reason why I keep on coming home to Space Out Radio is because yeah. this is one of those places where I can sit back and take my shoes off and make myself comfortable. Well, and don't forget to grab a beer from the fridge. 
That, it's always stacked for you, my <laughs> friend. Always stacked for you. You know, I, I want to ask you, with all the competition out there, Ron, you know, people self-publishing uh, books, people who are, you know, podcasting, broadcasting on YouTube, you know, taking this whole social media aspect really to the next level. I got to ask you, how have you been able to stand hand and shoulders above, or head and shoulders, pardon me, above the rest and really bring yourself up to that upper echelon of writers when we think of, you know, I consider you to be in that same category as, say, a Nick Pope or a David Weatherly or a John Tenney. Well, you, oh, wow. you know, that's I, I appreciate that. I'm very flattered to be in that company. Um, the way I look at the world of the paranormal is, first of all, I'm in awe of it. Uh, whenever I go to conferences, I am truly a fan of all these great researchers that I've followed throughout my life. And now I'm on the same panel as them. I mean, this is a great thing. I've been on panels with um, with Lauren Coleman and Ken Gearhart and Lyle Blackburn and all these people that I've really admired throughout my entire entire life as somebody that's pursuing this very strange field of the supernatural. Um, but I try to do as much research as I can. I try to look at it from a multidisciplinary point of view. So even if you don't believe in this stuff, even if you think this is complete hogwash, we're still trying to get to the psychological truth why we need these things that go bump in the night in our lives. And that is one thing that I've never um, pulled the reins on. I've always been that type of person that wants to appeal to a, a great multitude of people. So if you pick up my book and you're really into this kind of stuff and you're looking for the truth, then this is for you. I'll have some great um, you know, stories in there uh, about my research. But then again, on the flip side of it, if you do not believe in this and you just have a passing interest, my stories that I put out there and the research that I do is also going to make a sense because I look at the Jungian type of uh, psychology, the idea of a collective unconscious. Um, in all of my books, I try to follow these kind of um, lines, connecting the dots, if you will, throughout history of all these great type of you know creatures from Bigfoot to lake monsters, werewolves, vampires. Um, I try to make it as easily accessible to as, as many people as possible. So if you've never read my book or any of my books, I, I would urge you to pick up one. I mean, you, you can get them, like you said, on Amazon. And I would love to hear what you think, because I truly write books in a way that interests me. And um, and if it interests me and it keeps my attention, that's something that I want to read. And I think that everybody else would uh, follow in line and want to read the same thing. I think so as well. Crypto guru Ronald Murphy is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. We're going to go down the entire gamut of strange and weird topics. And even for Goddess Michelle, our resident nurse who's listening to us on Twitter, we will be talking about fairies and mermaids. I will get that in for you because... Oh. Yeah, Michelle's having a, a hard time right now because she's working so hard with uh, helping people due to the coronavirus. And, and you know, and then she lives in Nova Scotia near where that uh, catastrophic shooting happened over the weekend, leaving many people deceased. And so we want to give her some some big time love tonight, getting into those topics as well, just for her, just for her tonight. Hey, let's do it. We'll do it. I respect anybody that's on the front line of this. These people are truly heroes. The idea of essential workers, you know, it really puts everybody else to shame because these are the people that are not only making the world go round, but they're actually saving lives. So anything that I can do to brighten up a little bit of her night, I, I will definitely do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And uh, we love her around here. We we really, really do. Guru, you know, when you started in this, uh, you called yourself a folklorist. You know, for many people who don't understand what a folklorist is. Break that down for us. Well, I like to gather the, uh, you know, a lot of people call these things mythologies, the oral tradition from various cultures around the world. Um, a lot of people discount First Nation um, uh, uh, eyewitness uh, information, um, but I never did. I mean, that's one of the first places that I look to find out how 
Aboriginal people look at these things that we call Bigfoot or whatever other kind of monster that you call uh, because they were very closely tied to this. They are indelibly tied to these this link, the wilderness, the, you know, nature. Um, so whenever I gather accounts from around the world, that's the folklore that I gather. This this uh, the, these traditions that started out as oral traditions and that were eventually written down and later interpreted by white settlers or what have. You. But if you really look at the idea of folklore throughout the world, then these things that we call Bigfoot or wild men, or the things that we call werewolf or dog men, or even mermaids and fairies, all cultures from around the world have them. They're called various things in different tongues. But at the end of the day, we're talking about the exact same archetype. And as a researcher, I find that that you know unbelievably interesting. Um, and as you know, someone that investigates this boots on the ground type of thing, that really kind of urges me to continue uh, because. Obviously, there is something out there at some time. Um, you know, I, I hear reports that people talk about. I've, I've listened to your reports. Um, we, no, these people aren't lying. People haven't been lying about these things for 5,000 years. Something has been going on, and it obviously is still going on. Um, it's been discounted by mainstream science for whatever reasons. But for me and for, every, for, for the other great researchers that are out there looking into this, uh, this, this mystery, um, I think that we will be validated someday. I truly do. Um, and that's really what keeps me going. I, I, I want to hear more stories, and I want to get at the truth that's behind these stories. Well, you know, and you do a good job with it. And the one thing, I think it's because of your educational background that you have, you are very much a romanticist of vocabulary. And I don't know how else to put that because you're extremely eloquent. You're extremely bright. You're not going to find spelling mistakes in your book. Doesn't that, that drives me nuts, man. When I, when I read a book, man, and I am, and I am coming across spelling mistake after spelling mistake. It's like, geez, didn't anybody put this through spell check? Where's the editor on this, man? Where's the editor? But, but it's true. I mean, you have a real romanticism with your with your vocabulary that you're able to to paint a beautiful picture, and that is something that is very difficult for a lot of writers to do. You know what it is, um, and I was lucky that I did have a very good education. Um, uh, I have a, a degree in uh, in literature from the University of Pittsburgh. I have a degree in um, uh, religion, religious studies also from the University of Pittsburgh, and I went to graduate school, and I have a degree in history uh, for a graduate degree in history from uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, and I have a graduate degree in um, educational administration from St. Vincent College here in Pennsylvania as well. Um, so I, I, I do have an educational background, but I also want to tell the listeners that, that may not know this, that um, I'm also um, a poet. Poetry is one of the things that has always really kind of um, – um, inspired me throughout my life. And I have a few collections of poetry out there right now. I have um, uh, uh, Northern Star, which was just came out a couple of years ago. And about four years ago, I put out a collection called um, Gypsy Heart. And then um, my uh, fiance and I, uh, uh, Julie, we just released um, a new version of our new book called uh, Melancholia. And I will have Ars Erotica, which is a completely new kind of book. Not what you're thinking, of course, uh, but it's called Ars Erotica, and that is out now as well, too. It was just released about two weeks ago. So um, poetry is something that's always inspired me as well. So I think whenever I approach anything, it's always going to have that kind of romantic take to it. And it's interesting that you called me a romantic because one of the critics um, actually gave me a very nice review on my poetry, and they called me a modern romanticist, which I really do like I really hold dear but the idea of romanticism is just that you see the world a little bit beyond what you're dealing with you you can see a world picture you know that you belong to something greater than just the world inside your home and I look at that not only in my poetry but also in the way that I research the supernatural as well it's just not all about us it's just not all about you know tw you know 21st sec century technology or the place that you live uh, it's about so much more. It's about this this infinite um, chain of being that connects everybody together. Let's get into it because we have so many topics to cover with you tonight, and these shows with you always go 
incredibly fast, incredibly fast. So they do. You know what? We're just going to we're just going to time machine. We're just going to start jamming things in. And, And the reason why is in our Revolution Radio chat room, Captain Kirk in here asked me to ask you about Thunderbirds. And he's saying oh, yes. he's yes. saying that he's actually had two sightings, one in Boulder, Colorado, and once by Golden, Colorado. He said the first time this Thunderbird actually tried to attack him, and the second time he saw it, it was trying to grab a turkey vulture out of midair. For people who don't know or wow. aren't familiar with the turkey, or with the turkey vulture, of course we are, but of the Thunderbird, and I'm not talking the United States Air Force Thunderbirds. Okay, but with the legend of the Thunderbird, mm-hmm. let's get into it. What's happening with this giant bird? Well, first of all, let me point out that the uh, person that said they saw it attacking a uh, a vulture, uh, that's very interesting because the majority of the Thunderbird sightings that I follow up on usually have the vulture as the culprit. A lot of people don't understand that there's birds out there with an eight-foot wingspan that sometimes, you know, will pick up roadkill along the road. Uh, The first time I ever ran into a turkey vulture, I was going around a corner and um, it was over a deer carcass, and it had its wings outspread. It looked like something off of the Wild Kingdom, and its wingtips almost touched from one side of the road to the other. I mean, they're massive birds. So whenever an eyewitness says that it sees a, a bird even larger than that, attacking it, then there's something to be said there. So a Thunderbird is part of the Native American imagination. It's also part of the First Nations imagination as well, too. You have a lot of this stuff coming out of the Plains Indians. Um, And the reason why they called them a Thunderbird is this was a very large, um, you know, uh, avian that would be, that would come in with the storms. Now, from a zoological perspective, this does make a lot of sense. Something that is that large, and we're talking about a wingspan the size of a a Cessna. Some people report them that large. Um, We're talking about an animal that would take a lot of draft and a lot of uplift to keep something like that up. You know, these are soaring birds. These aren't like falcons, so they're not going to be propelling themselves very quickly. They're going to rely on the wind to, to, to take them along. So so whenever you look at the folklore of these of these First Nation accounts, of these traditional accounts, this makes sense that a bird comes in with the storms, because that's the kind of power that would be needed to keep something like this aloft. Now, um, there's reports here in Pennsylvania as well, too. I mean, I've, I've investigated many, many Thunderbird reports. Um, we look, um, well, I, I look as a cryptozoologist at the zoological record to figure out if there's anything in the fossil record that would kind of be an antecedent to this, okay? Um, we do have something called the Argent, uh, the Argentavis Magnificence, which was this very, very large bird that lived into the Pleistocene. It was believed that it may have died out two million years ago, but that doesn't mean there wasn't a remnant population in in the Americas, you know, 14,000 years ago, whenever the Ice Age was receded, there might have been still a few around to allude to the uh, collective unconscious, why people still um, have this this knowledge of this bird in their folklore. That's fine if you're a First Nations person, but there's a lot of people reporting these things today. Now, my question is, why are we not finding 14-foot-long pinion feathers. And I have an article about the uh, Thunderbirds in my book, The Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge, because they are reported in Western Pennsylvania. And I spoke to a lot of people, and they said that an, an animal this size would appear on radar. So are we talking about something that's a physical you know, a physical bird flying around, or are we talking about some sort of manifestation from another world or something that comes in from another dimension? These are the kind of things that I'm trying to work out. Um, but I get so many reports of people not only seeing these things, but coming in very close proximity to these things as well, too. I mean, up until maybe 50 years ago, there were reports in newspapers from around the country of children being picked up the, by these things. They were actually predatory type of birds, you know, because a bird this size would probably be a scavenger. But people have reported, you know, having children attacked or, you know, sheep carried off or dogs carried off. A lot of people reported these things. But, you know, getting back to the idea of the Thunderbird, it's obviously alive and well in some 
stretch of the imagination because people are still reporting encounters with these things. But, um, I but I mean, a, uh, let me let me ask you this. Uh, you know, when we okay. lo- when we look at these Thunderbirds, where would they be hiding? OK, because I realize North America is a big place. And, and as much as we don't like to think about it, there is a lot of uncharted territory in North America. It doesn't matter if you're in the lower 48 states or if you're in Canada or Alaska or even in areas of Mexico. All right. There's a lot of hiding spots for this. But if this is a creature that could be picked up on radar, how are we missing this? Why aren't we getting, you know, nearly daily reports of a 40 foot long bird flying? Right. That's that's my question. I mean, uh, you know, I, whenever I write about books of uh, my books about this kind of stuff, I also have to be very rational about this as well, too. Where is the evidence? Because if these things are flying around, that means that they're also breeding. And, you know, nobody's ever come upon a Thunderbird rookery. Um, although if you would go through the high plains of the uh, of the American Southwest, um, you can find a lot of very, very desolate, desolate points. Um, but again, you have to have a breeding population of these things. So where are they hiding out? Um, that's a good question. Here in Western Pennsylvania, we have the Chestnut Ridge is a place where I do a lot of my research, um, but there is still no hiding place, really a true haven for an animal this size. So that's whenever I start um, you know, questioning what is going on. Um, I've looked into the, the 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 viability that this might be something that is a crossover from another dimension, um, that this might be some sort of hallucination formed by the, the geology of the area around us, or of course, you know, talking to the to the to the person that's working in the healthcare industry, um, even the the realm of the fairy. This comes into play because in Ireland um, we have many many tales of fairies that will. Um, will turn into very large birds. They will kind of transform into very large birds. So as, as part of my research, I try to fill in the gaps as much as possible, and I gather all the, the, the traditional tells told by various peoples. Um, you know, the, the First Nations saw them very much as uh, physical entities, but they also have this kind of otherworldly power of the gods entities or uh, side of them as well. That is, if they were some sort of harbingers of the supernatural. So it's very hard to kind of pinpoint the Thunderbird down. In your estimation, is this a is this a mythical creature or a live creature that, much like Bigfoot, we just haven't found it yet? Um, see, uh, in in my estimation, uh, from the from the reports that I've gathered, people are seeing something that is physically there. With, with, without a doubt, um, I've, I, I interview people that are very young to very old, and um, there is something there that doesn't quite miss the, quite meet the eye, um, and it's something that is also not cataloged in science. This is not a misrepresentation of a vulture or an eagle or anything like that. This is something completely out of the ordinary. And a lot of people who are not, um, you know, they're not up on their zoology, of course, or <laughs> they don't have a working knowledge of Pleistocene um, uh, animals. Uh, uh, many people report this very unusual fan-like tell that uh, goes along with these uh, sightings as well. And our friend, the Argentavis uh, Magnificence, had one of those type of fan-like tells, one of these very, very unique things uh, in the avian world. And people are continually talking about this, and they're also drawing these things whenever they give eyewitness sketches. So they're obviously seeing something that is very much resembles this 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 extinct flying bird. So is there a possibility that there's still these kind of and they would be related to the condor. So is it possible there's an unidentified condor still um you know plying the skies of North America? Very unlikely, but it seems that it might be possible because people are still seeing these things. Guru, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break at the bottom of the hour. The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, is with us tonight on Spaced Out Radio. We are getting into all things strange, weird, and odd, and we're going to jam as much as we can into our short time with Ron, who we got for about another two hours here. But trust me, this one's going fast. CryptoGuru.net is his website. More with the crypto guru. We're getting into Bigfoot next on Spaced Out Radio. Nice. Just like that, 30 minutes down. How does that happen so fast with you? 
I, I, I don't know. Look, whenever I do my show with Brian, our shows usually go about an hour, and sometimes it's like pulling teeth. There's people on there that, you know, and these people are very, you know, they're well-published and everything, and it's like you're talking to a loaf of bread. They're not talking back at all. They're not offering anything. I don't know what's going on with some people, but I have fun with you when you ask good questions. And again, like I said, your audience is the best audience in the world. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. I, I really do. Our YouTube crowd, I I hope you guys are enjoying this so far with the guru, the cryptid guru. <laughs> there he is. <sighs> oh, it feels good. Feels good, man. Yes, it does. It does. Do you get the Travel Channel in Canada? I don't know if yeah, you do or not. Yeah, we do. I'm, I'm searching for you, man. I'm uh, searching for you. Yeah. Yeah, and for the listeners as well, too, we, we, we got to mention Red Earth Uncovered, which actually was up for uh, your version of the Emmy Award for um, the best uh, um, half uh, best uh, uh, factual half-hour show up in Canada. It didn't win last year, but, I mean, it's a very, very well-produced uh, 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 piece of uh, quality entertainment. And it deals with the First Nation point of view on these cryptids. So it's a really cool show. That is awesome, man. That is awesome. So what else have you been up to, man, throughout all of this? Are you, are you, how's the homeschooling going with your like 46 children that you have? Well, it's like 46 kids. Uh, it's absolutely horrible because I'm also working at home. And because I'm affiliated with the school district, I'm working with 40 other kids who are also home as well, too. So it's it's just maddening. Like tomorrow I have a class from 9 o'clock in the morning until 3.30. And it's all virtual, of course. It's all online now because we can't meet in person. So it's it's like dealing with, with um, you know, like, like 50 kids every single day, five days a week it's horrible jesus jesus hey do any of yeah. your, and, any, and, any of and your was, students know that you do all this cryptid stuff they do you know it was interesting because the, the first school that i work with they told me that i can't talk about this kind of stuff because they were afraid how it would it would go and i remember that i was in the car pickup line uh dropping kids off and this one guy rolled roll down his window and he goes hey are you that guy into the ghost stuff? And I said, yeah. He goes, will you take me out sometime? And after that, I mean, there was a lot of a lot of families that were very interested in the things that I did. And it ended up that I actually took the school out, uh, some of the, the faculty, the staff uh, out uh, on a ghost hunt. We had some pretty strange things happen to us. So I think that, that kind of changed their outlook on the things that I do. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, but so for the most part, I get, because I live in a small town, I get a lot of write-ups in the paper, so it's very hard to keep this kind of stuff quiet. But yeah, for the most part, I mean, you will find some people that simply do not want to work with me because, of course, they're you know these these devout Christians, and of course, you can't talk about this kind of stuff if you're a devout Christian according to their 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 way of thinking. So I do have that kind of backlash, but for the most part, it's pretty it's pretty um, positive. Yeah, we had uh, we had. Uh, hey, thanks. There, uh, Fabster. Really appreciate that, man. That's that's awesome. Thank you so much for the super chat. And uh, wow, <laughs> this guy, he, Fap and his grandmother, his grandma Rose. All right, she's she's my she's my eldest listener. She uh, sits and and they hang out together, and and they sit and listen to the show here. Uh, almost every night and Fabster and, and grandma Rose hang on out and they, they absolutely love what we do. Grandma Rose is like 96 years old, I believe. And uh, how, oh. how awesome is that? You know, I, you know, she's, she's my eldest listener that I know of and we absolutely love it that she's right into these strange and weird topics. So grandma Rose, mwah, big kiss for you, my dear, big kiss for you. We love you. Wow. here. Where, where, where is grandma Rose from? Uh, I do not know. I do not know. She might have some stories. Probably does. Probably does. Yeah. But it's pretty awesome, man. What am I? Yeah, it really is. And that just goes to show the kind of following that you have. You, you transcend all generations, my friend. Well, it's the beard. It's the power of the beard. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, I'm going to oil mine up tomorrow, all nice and everything like that. I cannot wait. 
All right, perfect. Yeah, make sure you get some beard oil for that. Uh, go on my website. I do. I do have some. My yeah. my, my guy. Oh wait! Oh, that's right. Yeah, my guy has some really yeah, good, 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 fresh stuff there, man. Good fresh stuff. Yeah, I'll look into that. You know, that, we we need to get beard uh, uh, sponsors. Now that's good that you have one. So I'm going to look into that. Yeah, hit him up. He'll he'll treat you what right. And if you use pro- nice, very nice. If you use promo code S O R twenty nineteen, he'll give you a deal. Oh, very good. Then I'll do that. Hey, Grandma Rose, just so you know, or Fabster, if you're on Twitter, I think you are on Twitter, uh, Maureen at hashtag Spaced Out Radio uh, put a nice tweet to your uh, grandma there. So make sure you show her that, hashtag Spaced Out Radio on Twitter. So check that on out. Yes, we love Grandma Rose around here. And I, I can feel her. She's all laughing at Giddy right now. Woo-hoo! You know, I love it. Love it. I wish my grandma would tune in. I really do. She doesn't really internet, though. <laughs> All right. Here we uh we got about 30 seconds, brother. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay, cool. Very cool. Yes. Yes. Uh do, do, do. Yes. I love the comments. Have you seen any mountain lines or anything? Have you seen any mountain lines up there anytime soon there, Dave? Uh you know what? Uh looking. They should be coming out anytime. I haven't heard any, but I uh there was one in town. Uh, in one subdivision, but uh, yeah, when you walk around now, you see people carrying the mace and the pepper spray around now, so wow. that, that's kind of cool. Yeah, the bears will be here anytime. Bears will be here anytime. Uh, wow. One second here. Hey, we want to remind everybody, big thank you to FAP for the Super Chat. Super Chat is open. Great way to support this show is do what Spook Cat did. Go to the SOR vault on our website and grab yourself a t-shirt. Here we go. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. So glad to have each and every one of you tuning on in. Reminder to you that if you miss parts of this show or others, you can check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR, Newswire, and so much more. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, the show at Spaced Out Radio. And of course, you can check out my personal profile at Dave Scott SOR. Tonight, we got the crypto guru here, and we're going to get into some Bigfoot. Ronald Murphy is one of the most successful and naturally blessed authors. And if you're looking for a great author who can really tell us a story, I got to tell you, Ronald Murphy is the guy. That's why we call him the crypto guru around here, cryptoguru.net. And he's got a great podcast with the triple B, big bad, make that quadruple B, big bad Brian Bowden. (laughs) <laughs> called called the Inside the Goblin Universe. You want to check that out as well. Brian's got a good beard as well going on here. So does the He guru. does. He does. Yeah. How you been doing, man? Thank you for coming on. Oh, hey, I'm looking for This is the highlight. It's been probably about a year since I've been on. I think it's been about that long, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it has been um, It's been a while. But, you know, yeah, it's been a while. So we can't have that anymore. So I've been looking to, forward to this since I talked to you last week and we got to, we got to make this more of a habit. Well, I agree with you. I, I totally agree with you and let's, and let's make sure that happens. Let's make sure. Cause it, it, when you come on, everybody wins each and every one of our audience members wins. So, I mean, that's how we are. Hey, I want to get into a little bit of a controversial story that seems to have really, really reared its ugly head again. And this is attacking one of the gentlemen who filmed the legendary Bigfoot film out of Bluff Creek. Bob Gimlin has been accused of killing Bigfoot along with Roger Patterson. And allegedly there is this cover up that went on with John Green, Bob Titmus, and it's really affecting Gimlin, who really has never been a rich man. He, you know, his video has is only second to the JFK Zapruder film that has been disputed as much. And this is a gentleman who has literally for the past 50 plus years lived in a living hell in defending himself, his family, all for filming a Bigfoot. Tell me what's going on here. 
That's right. Well, a few things are going here, my friend. So we're talking about October 20th, 1967, the iconic Patterson-Giblin film at Bluff Creek. Um, you know, uh, Roger Patterson was one of these guys that's been looking for this creature. Uh, Bob Gimlin was, you know, one of, one of these quintessential cowboys that was kind of tagging along for the ride. And um, they... Uh, uncovered their their quarry. You know, they uncovered what they were looking for. And you have that very, very shaky um, image of, of what is now called Patty. You know, this this um, you know, obviously female um, bipedal hair-covered creature that looks back at the camera and takes off into the woods. Now, this, for our collective imaginations, is what Bigfoot looks like, and it's from that film that so many people have come into the into the field. You know, that's one of the things that started me as a kid. I remember watching it on one of those um, Sun um, uh, movie productions, and you see this thing walking, and it doesn't make any sense um, from a little kid looking at it to an adult looking at it right now. It doesn't make any sense because it looks so good. And we're talking about something that is over 50 years old. So, um, well, you know, it looked like people had filmed, um, you know, a Sasquatch. Now, over the years, a lot of things has come about. Uh, and one of the newest things is that what was recorded was the aftermath of a massacre um, that, uh, depending upon who you talk to, uh, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin were responsible for killing it, or they were responsible for getting the Canadian government there to kill it um, in order to allow logging in the area because these creatures were harassing the loggers. Um, but what it's coming down to now, uh, very recently, is that there is a, a supposition that uh, Patterson and Gimlin had come along come upon these creatures, um, they had opened fired or somebody had opened fired on them. And what you see is a wounded um, Bigfoot creature that is trying to get away from them as they're pursuing it to eventually shoot it down. Now, a lot can be said about this because um, as the uh, quality of the film has been um, restored uh, more and more, um, you have people like um, Jeff Meldrum, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, out of the University of Idaho, looking at this and saying, you know, you can see the musculature moving underneath the skin. And then he said that you can also see some, some wounds on it, this one bulging muscle in the leg in particular. Now, by him saying that, it seems that you know the wrong types of people have taken that in to mean that that was a very fresh inju injury, and not only a fresh injury, but one that was caused by a bullet. And now people are pointing out that you know you can see red on the coat of this creature, you can see red in the sand around Bluff Creek. Um, so what is going on now is that Bob Gimlin, who has always told the story that Roger Patterson said to um, – Definitely put the gun on this creature if it would charge, but not to shoot at it. That was been Bob Gimlin's story since this film first came out, that no shots were ever fired. But now people are making it seem as if Gimlin was at least an accomplice in this kind of shootout there on Bluff Creek that took out a family of Bigfoot. A lot of people say that there's more than one Bigfoot on that particular image, that you can see some hiding or you can see one that has even fallen and it's dead. Um, a lot of things have come out on that little piece of film that I personally cannot see. But that's one of the new things. So a lot of people are saying now that they stand with Bob Gimlin, that what he has to say is actually factual, that he's not trying to hide anything. And I agree. Um, some of the people that are coming out saying that this indeed happened, they're claiming that they talked to Roger Patterson's widow, and she backed up the story that, yes, indeed, there was Bigfoot that were killed that day. But um, I'm going to stand up for uh, for uh, uh, Roger or for Bob Gimlin, As, look, this this gentleman is in the twilight of his years. Um, he's making no money off of this thing whatsoever. Um, he appears every now and then on shows, but you know he's not in great health. Um, he's he's an old gentleman who just wants to go about his life, and the last thing that he needs now is some sort of controversy to come up. Um, you know about, about this thing. So I think that we really do need to make a stand and kind of air 
started this out, and I'm glad that you're bringing up this uh, this up uh, this 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 this, this uh, controversy tonight because that's something that we can talk about a little bit. But yeah, I I do not see it. Um, by looking at that film as something that is a, a, a creature that is in agony, that has been shot, that you know, that it doesn't seem that way to me. The motion seemed to be very fluid. It doesn't seem like it's getting. It seems like it's it's leisurely getting away. It, there's no kind of attack movement that this thing makes. It doesn't look like it's in pain or anything like that. So I really think that we really have to stand up and say what Bob Gimlin said was was true. True, and that all these people that are making these these fantastical speculations is just trying to make money off of something that is over fifty years old. Why can't the Bigfoot community leave him alone? I mean, when you have somebody who comes out in any other field, okay, they are they are considered almost like royalty. Yet with Bob Gimlin, who is now I believe eighty five years old, all right, they. In, the, in this Bigfoot community, continue to harass him, call him a faker, call him a liar, call him every name under the sun from every rumor they have ever heard. And I think it's disgusting, and I think it puts a real black eye on the entire Sasquatch community. Well, it does. Um, one of the reasons why they're doing this, I think, is because Bob Gimlin can simply not be bought. He is not in this for profit. He's not going to take a paycheck from somebody to side with them. He's a genuine human being. He's telling his side of the story. He's a very matter-of-fact gentleman, and he has really nothing to profit off of it. If, if he wanted to, think about it this way, Dave. If he wanted to profit off of this, and he wanted to change his tune and say, yeah, sure, we open fire and all this stuff, he could make a lot of money off of this. He could write a, a book. He could have a ghostwriter write a book about the Bluff Creek Massacre and all this other kind of stuff. But he doesn't because he's sticking with the story that is true, that what they had encountered that day was something completely out of the, uh, out of the ordinary, and there was no shots fired. But I think the reason why there's so much backlash against this gentleman is simply because he is genuine. He's not there trying to make friends. He's not there trying to make enemies. But people have vilified him because he is so um, so honest. I truly think that's the reason. Yeah, and, and you know what? I look at the way that many in this community are, and it, it, it actually surprises me that you use the name Dr. Jeff Meldrum because he is considered to be one of the most organized and top researchers scientifically in the field of Sasquatch. And yet for him to come out with these claims that that you can see blood stains and the way the the creature is is struggling to walk. You know what? I've watched that video two, three hundred times. I've never seen it struggle to walk. I've never seen blood right. on the new footage or anything like that. Are we reaching here? Have we got to that point where we are reaching? Because it just seems like we're trying to create drama where there is no drama necessary. Uh, agreed. Um, I, and I think the analogy that we can make is the idea of publish or perish in this field, that we have to have something new for people to sink their teeth into, uh, some sort of conspiracy, because people like conspiracy. And the more outlandish it is, the more people will tend to take it. Look at this uh, whole um, uproar that was caused by Todd Standing not too long ago, when it was, he was filming these these Bigfoot creatures that you know you could only see the head and the eyes would move every now and then. And you know somebody like um, the Jeff Meldrum, who I respect and I've been on panels with him before, um, and I use a lot of his research uh, in, in into the into the world of Bigfoot in my research as well. I, I parenthetically have documented him many times in my works. Um, but he is one of these people, and he's also a genuinely nice guy as well too. But he is one of these people that will actually align himself with people that are very um, you know, malignant in this community because he is trying to get to the bottom of this mystery as well. 
But whenever he aligns with these people, even if it's just for research, he seems to be promoting them or condoning them. And that is being – that's working in his disadvantage. I mean there for a while, there wasn't very much that he was turning down. There was a Discovery Channel um, program made about the capturing of a Bigfoot, and it was very much aligned to uh, the way they did the uh, Mermaids Uncovered. It was uh, uh, one of these docudramas where there was a lot of – you know. Um, fakery going on as well, too, but they were trying to sell it as if it were an authentic piece of, of investigation, and it wasn't that way. But he appeared on that. Now, I would never do something like that for the simple reason is I do not want to mislead anybody, and I don't think that he genuinely set out to mislead anybody, but he will um, very rarely, it seems, turn down any kind of um, uh, project um, and I think that a lot of that has to go with just that he is trying to find answers to these these questions. Um, but in so doing, people are using his prestige and his name against him. If he appears on your show, you're immediately going to believe it because he is such a well-respected person in this field. But he really has to be a little bit more careful about who he who he sides with, and he has to do a lot more editing, I believe, on the way he – you know, even with Todd Standing, he said that he thinks that there was still um, validity into a lot of that man's investigations. Um, and I don't know what your opinion of, uh, of Todd Standing is or the listener's uh, opinion of Todd Standing is, but uh, the more uh, research I've done into his background, the more it seems as if he may be leaning towards the, line, the, the, the side of the charlatan than the researcher. So what about the idea that there was an alleged frozen body of this creature that was killed? Well, that's Yep, that's the other thing as well, too, like the Minnesota Iceman. Um, part of this conspiracy as well is that one of the Bigfoots that were shot at Bluff Creek uh, ended up to be the body in that block of ice. I mean, that was one of the other types of uh, of things, even though there uh, there's, there's evidence of Minnesota Icemen uh, well before this as well, these kind of carnival gas that are traveling around. Um, whenever uh, the Minnesota Icemen was um, uh, first um, uh, looked at by cryptozoologists, um, there seemed to have been some wounds on that creature. Uh, one um, researcher said that the uh, one eye was um, actually dangling as if it had been shot in the head, um, and it seemed to have some blood in the ice as well, too. So I think what we're doing is we're kind of um, um, making the story up to fit what is going on at Bluff Creek. So somebody is looking at this small little piece of evidence and say, oh, that was obviously one of the creatures that was from that incident, and it was frozen, and we have the evidence all the time, and you know, it was uncovered, and then the government kind of whisked it away and, and put it under the carpet type of thing. So there's really a lot of dead ends in this, um, and people are trying to make something out of absolutely nothing. But that's an excellent point uh, that they would th that they thought this Minnesota Iceman might have been the result of, of that particular slaying of these creatures. I mean, can we look for any more type of excuses? Uh, I just, you know, I'm listening to you talk, and I'm sure a number of people are if they're tuning on in, and I'm listening to you, and I'm just I, I'm just rolling my eyes, you know, and and it makes me want to swear. It makes me want to swear and call mm -hmm. the BS that this truly is, Ron. I mean, we got to start leaving the guy alone. He's 85 he years old. Right. He's never made a dime off of this. Anybody else in his position would have literally tried to to take this straight to Hollywood and make a ton of money. And after 15 years right. of, of basically not having a, a pot to go to the bathroom in, I mean, people are still attacking him. And, you know, right. it doesn't matter what the theory is. Why can't we? Let's look at the overall big picture. Why can't we let it go, Ron? Right. And that's my point exactly. Somebody in Gimlin's case has nothing to lose. He could easily make fifty or sixty thousand dollars by doing an hour interview on television saying, you know, this is what happened, you know, we opened fire, you know, these creatures are out there. Of course he could make some money. He could put a put a put a book out and make, you know, um, you know, tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand dollars off of it if he would go along with this as well. 
that gentleman has nothing to hide. He's not making anything up. He's telling the truth. And these other people, I think, that probably wanted to have him come on over to their side and say the exact same thing. Um, he did not do it, so now he's being vilified for it. I really think – look, there's a lot of money to be made out in this field if you don't mind uh, faking things. If you don't mind lying, if you don't mind being the next P.T. Barnum, there's a lot of money to be made in this field because people people are so enamored by this 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 creature that they want to find out anything that's new. And to bring out something this novel, this 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 preposterous, people do want to buy into it and look into it. But he could make a huge payday off this, and the reason why he's not making a payday off of it is because he's refusing to lie about it. That's the bottom line, and they need to leave this guy alone. He's an icon for everybody in the cryptozoological world. If if he really could make any money off of this by coming out. I'm sure that he would, but after this many years, my friend, there's he's not coming out because there's nothing to come out about. Well, let me ask you this then. With this community, we're always looking for proof. We always want that evidence. Uh-huh. We always want that proof. And when the proof is finally there, even though it's 50 years old, look, we're still going back 50-some years to 1967 for the only real piece of evidence that we actually have about this creature because there are so many people out there faking and hoaxing videos out there and yet they aren't getting as vilified as they're not as gimlin is exactly um and i don't know what it is about these iconic pictures why people are are really hating on them so much I remember doing a panel discussion with um, uh, Linda Godfrey and um, uh, uh, Lauren Coleman up at the Michigan uh, uh, Paracon, and this was um, two years ago, as a matter of fact. And uh, we brought up the, the slide of the uh, of the Nessie sighting, the surgeon's photo. And uh, you know, Lauren Coleman, someone that I have respected for years and years, um, he claimed that it was a hoax uh, because the surgeon was having an affair. Uh, with a lady in London, and uh, he hoaxed the photograph to show that he was at Loch Ness instead of sleeping with this woman in London. Now, that seems like a long way to go around to prove to your wife that you weren't having an affair with somebody. You know, I'm still kind of blown away by the unedited uh, Nessie photo. Um, A lot of people say that this is a toy submarine, but if you would look at the unedited photo, you could actually see the far bank at Loch Ness. And I've done research on Loch Loch Ness in person. It's a vast body of water, and if you would take a toy submarine, it would quickly be engulfed by that by that landscape. But if you look at the, this particular surgeon's photo that's not been edited, and you can see the far bank, this looks like a fairly large, substantial creature in the water. But even people, like I said, like like Lauren Coleman, who I respect very, very much, uh, he has really earned his due. But he will even go as far to say that that was faked and it was to, to hide a uh, an affair that was going on. People will, for whatever reason, look at this evidence um, and and really kind of have hatred towards it. Um, and this is really what got us started in it. And like you said, there's people doing Photoshop now with things that look remarkably well. I mean, there's, there's flying gargoyles out there now climbing church steeples if you want to get on YouTube and see this kind of stuff. In my opinion, they're obviously Photoshopped, but nobody's coming out and, 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 and speaking against that. Um, there's one program out called Paranormal Caught on tape. Uh, The vast majority of the uh, segments on that show are things that have been debunked. Some of these things have been done but uh, been debunked years ago, but people are still going on there talking as if these are actual photographs. But then you have somebody like you know these 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 pictures like and the Nessie photograph that you know that that word is quite old, and people are still lashing out against these things. I don't know what it is. I think a lot of it is jealousy. I think a lot of it is that the people that took the photos is no longer here to defend themselves, um, and um, I, I I think that a lot of it is 
just ignorance. This thing that people in, in that particular time could not provide the evidence because somebody has been looking for the same stuff with all this high tech technology uh, for all their lives. And they right. can't come up, come up with something themselves. I think that has a lot to say too. Guru, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. The crypto guru, Ronald Murphy. We got him for another 90 minutes on Space Out Radio. His website, CryptoGuru.net. Find all his books in any major bookstore or on Amazon. Coming up next, we're getting into mermaids, fairies. Let's get into some folklore with the guru. All right, Guru, I'm going to quickly run my dogs outside. Give me a couple minutes. I'm just going to put some uh, music on for uh, the audience here, okay? Or some commercials. It's going there. Fast, this is my the going going lawyer, I know. W. I'll be right back, brother. I'd like to invite you to listen in right. each Sunday night where we're going to open up your eyes to everything strange and paranormal. I will be hosting some great guests with topics that affect us all, such as UFOs, ghosts, and everything paranormal. Let's learn together on Spaced Out Radio Sunday with myself, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer at spacedoutradio.com. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's West Coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the Moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the Moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the story you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. We all know on Spaced Out Radio, we love a good beard and mustache. So why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacy Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend. Woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights right here at spacedoutradio.com. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just five bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines Report. We are independent and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines Report. 
We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. All right, Guru, I'm back. We've got three and a half minutes, Excellent, my friend, excellent. Three and a half minutes. Well, this is awesome. This is very good. So you say that that beard oil stuff, now, what was it again? What was the the thing? Because I'm going to write it down now. What was it? Uh, It's Mighty Moose Beard Oil. Mighty Moose Beard Oil. And what is the code? Uh, SOR 2019. 2019. And, okay, yeah. And don't I'm forget, check that don't, don't forget tomorrow, though. Right. Don't forget though. You're actually saving money because you're paying in, you're you're paying American for Canadian uh, uh, costs. Right, right, right. Very cool. Because that's the one thing is, uh, you know, people with beards like this, you got to maintain these things, and uh, a lot of the stuff on the market's crap. So this is going to be good. Yeah, man. Give it a try. I I use it. I love it. I'm not saying that because. Uh, yeah. They're a sponsor, but I know Gary. Uh, uh, you know, and Gary is uh, Gary is a good, a good, good guy, man. Y- yes, he's Dutch, okay, uh, and I and I hold that against him. <laughs> All right, every every that's right, you know, yeah. every chance yeah. <laughs> I get. That's right. <laughs> but, but I'm sure there's a couple good Dutch people out there, so we uh, can get over. N- this. Not really, not really, <laughs> not really. You know. Oh, I love it. I love oh, it. Oh yeah, but uh, no, Gary's a good friend, very good friend, and uh, and uh, he, uh, it's all natural product too. And like I said, you're paying, you know, American do- uh, American dollars on the Canadian price. So uh, I believe right now, you if you put in like. You know, like I think its prices are like twenty bucks, so that would be like, like sixteen dollars American. Yeah, very cool, very cool indeed. Yeah, yeah. I'll give him a call tomorrow. I don't yeah. know, or I'll give him a look up tomorrow. Yeah, 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 yeah Mighty Moose Beard Oil. Hey, uh, just uh, give me a couple seconds here. Hey, Fapster, uh, you, you just played back the audio about Grandma Rose from a dad, and he here and he just laughs so very hard hey faps dad how you doing faps dad good to have you on board audra how you doing beautiful good to see you hi sandra hi sandra hi sandra and big bad brian bowden is here he's got a question oh fantastic oh yeah he's asking about lockdown ufo sightings to the audience that's what he's trying to trying to pitch uh uh uh, he's trying to pitch uh, your show and mine. Stealing my audience! Stealing my audience! Still in your dirty audience. Dirty bastard! Still. You know, if that dirty bastard wants to hurry up and get on there where he and I can come on together, you know that we're working on a book together about yeah. uh, UFOs in... Uh, hey, it, hold, it, hold, hold, hold on here, Ron. Ron, hold, <laughs> hold on, because i got to come back on here. At Spaced Out Radio. And on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. We welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates across the continent. On the digital side, we're proud to broadcast on Talk Stream Live and Revolution Radio. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Jack Detation. Jack Detation is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire, along with follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio for the show, my personal handle, at Dave Scott SOR. The man with the at Crypto Guru Ron on Twitter, Mr. Ronald Murphy, otherwise known as the Crypto Guru. He is here tonight talking all things weird, strange, and odd. His website, CryptoGuru.net. You can find all of his books online, like Amazon, as well as in any major bookstore. Ron, welcome back to the show. 
Oh, I'll tell you what, it's just flying by. Every time that we're on together, it feels like we're stepping into a time machine, and time just goes so quickly. So, well, like I said uh, earlier, we're going to have to make this a habit. Oh, absolutely. We got to get you and Bowden on the show, Brian Bowden. We got to get both of you on. I, I want to well, know what know, kind of antics you guys can get up to. Well, you know what? We've, we've met each other uh, uh, several times. We've done a couple conferences together. Uh, he's been to my house, actually, which I cannot wait to you get down here as well, too, Dave. Um, it's been too long since we've, because uh, I've never met you in person, so we have to do that. But Brian and I are working on a book right now, which is a rather unique take on some things. Um, we're looking at um, ancient American sites that um, seem to have UFO influence. Let's just put it this way. Um, and we're working on this book. Um, my part of the book is already done, and Brian has to get off the pot. Now, once he gets off of that proverbial pot, Dave, the kind of information that we're going to have in this book is going to link up cultures from around the world with some very interesting sites uh, in America. So uh, as soon as that is done, hopefully we can be on this program together. Actually, we will actually debut it on your program. How about if we do it that Let's way? Let's do it. And I think that this will be a very interesting uh, three-hour conversation. Awesome. Let's do that. We will definitely yeah. do that. And Bowden in the chat room says, yeah. we will get arrested. We will get arrested. Oh, come on. Come on. So all we need is the men in black showing up saying uh, we're canceling Spaced Out Radio. You know? That's right. That's right. But, but we'll do it in such a way that it will have an academic flow to it. So they'll just think that they, they don't read that kind of stuff. They no. want to read this kind of uh, no. Pulp Fiction trash, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right. I want to ask you, all right, about mermaids. Because sure. around the world, whether it's in tropical areas or whether it's in deep, dark waters like the west coast of British Columbia, there's always been this legend of mermaids in the water. Some very voracious and vicious trying to attract assailants from sailboats that were going across the seven seas. Others that were just saying it was a beautiful creature that saved me from drowning and brought me to shore. What is the truth about mermaids? Do we believe that there is actually a mermaid species out there? Well, see, these are great questions. And, you know, these are some of the things I try to answer in my book on mermaids, which is actually the first book on the series, on my on series. And this is because my daughter, Willow, uh, was watching a show about mermaids on television. And she said, Dad, do mermaids exist? And I said, well, I don't know. I never gave it much thought. And she said, well, you write all this crap about Bigfoot. Is there any way you can uh, do some research on mermaids? And I said, well, I'll see what I can find. And after about a week's worth of research, and this was just kind of cursory you know, research, just a little side thing, I became so fascinated that my On Mermaids became the very first book in my On series. And what I found out was extremely intriguing and, you know, really Really unexplicable. Um, if you look at mermaid sightings around the world, even in Africa, whenever a lot of the mermaids are sighted in, in um, uh, tributaries and in, in waterways, uh, in streams, um, they appear to be uh, white. You know, they they have they appear to be Caucasian rather than than African, which is really kind of telling for a particular culture. And we do have a a plethora of mermaid legends in various African tribes that are still being witnessed to this day. As a matter of fact, uh, about ten years ago, there was a dam being put in. And um, uh, they actually had to call in witch doctors to try to exercise the waters because there was a claim that mermaids were attacking the workers that were putting the dams in. So people are still seeing mermaids to this day. Um, Christopher Columbus and his voyage to the New World actually reported sightings of mermaids. And, you know, people think that these might have been, you know, dugons or these might have been uh, manatees. Um, but I, I don't think so. People that are out of the ocean really become um, intimately connected with the creatures that are out there. And I think by us saying in a modern world that they were misidentifying something, 
is really being um, uh, slighting these people. Uh, these were intelligent people that were able to navigate, uh, you know, these waters by taking bearings on the sun and on stars. You know, these people knew what was going on, and I don't think they were misidentifying anything. I think they were seeing something that was actually out there. And you know, uh, this is odd. But I still, at every conference that I attend, somebody invariably comes up to me and says that they've had a mermaid sighting. One woman actually claimed that she heard a mermaid singing to her oh, nice. from a um, from a lake in Reno, Nevada. So, I mean, these are very, very interesting things. Um, so uh, what are mermaids? You know, that, that, that's, the, that's the thing. Um, in the Renaissance, we have the great alchemist Paracelsus that stated that mermaids were of the same nature as um, as fairies, uh, that these were elemental spirits, and this was an intelligence that lived within the waters. And I think that, that makes sense to me as well, too. But if these are intelligences that are in the water, they are manifesting themselves as as the typical mermaids, almost always women, um, almost, you know, very, very beautiful, very tempting. Um, but, you know, from the one of the earliest um, images of what would be called a mermaid is from sub-equatorial Africa, dated to a time whenever the, the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, was actually in the desert at the time. So we're probably going back nearly 30,000 years. And there is rock carvings by the Son people that show something that looks like it has arms, uh, a head, a torso that tapers down into the, the lower uh, extremities of a fish. Um, so what are we supposed to do with that? You know, and then you have um, Greek uh, legends of the mermaids. You have the figures on 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 their earthenware and such. Uh, you have the Romans uh, talking about mermaids. And then whenever you get up into the Middle Ages, you have churches that have mermaids in their stained glass windows carved into their pews. So mermaids have been with us as long as any other of these cryptids that we talk about as well. So there's something to be said about that. There's definitely a lineage. There's definitely something to be said about mermaids from the aboriginals in Australia that reported them to Native Americans. Like you said, there's Native American lore um, throughout the not only the, uh, the West Coast out in Vancouver, but also the East Coast of the United States as well. So so there's something going on from a folklorist perspective. This is something that has been part of the vernacular of cultures around the world, and people are still citing this. So there is something to be said about this. Look, we know more about the surface of the moon than we do of our oceans. And to say that there's no, something out there that could not be very similar to what we would call a mermaid uh, swimming around, that's – I, again, you're 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 not really thinking outside of the box. You're 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 being skeptical, and uh, there's really no room for for skepticism in life. That's the way I, I I tell my children. You know, just because science tells you that it's not out there doesn't mean it isn't out there. It means it's not cataloged, and that means a lot. You know, until science can put it down and pin it down and take pictures and dissect it, they're never going to say it's out there. But that doesn't mean that it is. It doesn't mean it's not out there at all. Well, you know, I can understand people seeing mermaid-like creatures if you're on a beach set or have a connection close to the ocean. But to have a mermaid sighting in the middle of the lake in Nevada, I'm not buying that one. I'm sorry. Like, well, like the tinfoil comes off right. when I get to claims like that. Well, not only was it a lake in Nevada, it was a man-made lake in Nevada. So this is where we kind of bridge into something else, some other territory. What if we are saying that mermaids are elemental spirits of, of, of bodies of water? Okay, now at that point, it becomes very interesting, doesn't it? Is there something to be said that in natural surroundings in this world, whether we talk about forests or we talk about deserts or we talk about large bodies of water, can we say that there may become denizens of these things that have this intelligence, this kind of guardianship over these things, and we call them mermaids, but they're actually some sort of 
caretaker of this particular environment. Uh, of course, whenever you talk about fairies, people kind of, you know, they kind of shy away from that term because they think about the little Tinkerbells from uh, Walt Disney, and they think about this little uh, uh, Marilyn Monroe figure with diaphanous wings. But if we think about it, you know, kind of differently and think about that all of matter is made up of, of different elements, and is it possible that these elements come together to form a particular type of sentient being? I mean, it's extremely possible. That's something that I've been researching now for, for over a decade. And it starts making sense to me that even though we're talking about man-made bodies of water, we're talking about the attraction to these things or the manifestations out of these things. And it's a very, very interesting course of topic. I mean, it's actually a show all unto itself. But um, uh, look, it, just, just to go a little bit far afield, you know, if I could take a little tangent here. Please do. Um, we, know, yeah, we know that human thought can, um, can manipulate our environment. Um, people have taken plants and, you know, they, they, they will sometimes play music for them. But there's also been studies whenever you would, you know, go in every morning and curse them and tell you how much you hate them. And you still take care of them, but your, your emotions towards those things seem to affect to the point that they don't do very well and they eventually die. Now, there has been one Japanese study that shows that water can also be affected the exact same way, that if you show praise towards water, the very molecular structure of that water changes. Now, is it possible, I, again, you know, we're all talking about speculation and conjecture, but is it possible that water and all the elements around us have this kind of built-in um, being that can take shape and take form. Um, I am a very uh, a big proponent on the Gaia theory that the world we live on is an intelligent being, you know, um, that uh, if we can somehow get in harmony with the world around us, life would be a lot easier on everybody and everything. That if we learn to get along with not only our fellow man, but also the rainforest and everything that's in them, and we have this common respect, that life would be a lot different. So is it possible that the world around us has this ability to influence us the same way we have our ability to influence it? And sometimes it appears in a guise that we find acceptable, such as a wild man or a mermaid, something to think about. And now, of course, that deals a lot with the fairy realm as well, too, because fairies are never really one thing, are they? They're always kind of nebulous. They're always kind of taking different shapes. Um, so there is something to be said about the idea of shape-shifting and, and, and this intelligence that somehow um, uh, affects the way we feel about the world around us. Do you believe there are areas and pockets on the planet right now where this species is surviving? Oh, yes, without a doubt. Um, whenever I wrote my fairy book, I found it very interesting that people like are on cruise ships. You know, they don't report seeing fairies, but a lot of people on cruise ships don't report seeing anything uh, whenever they're out there because they follow a natural route. It's almost like having a highway out on the water. So naturally, large animals or intelligent animals, especially like whales, aren't going to be in those particular areas because you want to stay away from human beings because human beings usually don't treat uh, other living things very well. Um, and it's very possible that these things that we call mermaids are existing w away from people. Now, there's a lot of other things to be said from a biological perspective. Are these things air-breathing animals? Are they kind of, you know, are, are they cetacean? Are they, are they like a whale or are they like a dolphin? Or are they more, um, you know, humanoid? Or, you know, are they actually in the form that what we would think of a mermaid would be? Is that what they are? I'm tending to think that they're probably not, but they look so much similar to the way we would think that they differentiate themselves from other animals. That's the way I look at it. But, but to say um, that there is something in the ocean that has not been discovered unequivocally, I think that any mainstream scientist would say the exact same thing, that sea monsters exist in some 
rationale. Uh, and by that, an extension of that to say that there's something that could be like a mermaid, an intelligent, advanced species swimming our oceans. I think that that can also be said. Um, and look, I, I live in Pennsylvania, and I know in eastern Pennsylvania, there was a report, um, I, I believe it was in the early 1900s, maybe the 1920s, of a fisherman spotting a mermaid in the Susquehanna River of all places. Now, a lot of uh, critics have said that it was a seal that got off track and kind of went up the river, but but people, this is so part of the collective consciousness of the world that people still see these things. Um, in Israel, you know, the government put out a bounty of anybody that could capture a mermaid because these things were being seen all the time. And if you want to go to YouTube and look up um, Israeli mermaids, you can see a lot of really cool um, <laughs> photoshopped mermaids. But people were reporting these things all the time to the point that the government actually stepped in. Are they misidentified or are they misidentified animals that we already know? I'm sure a vast portion of reports are, but there's also that small portion that that would say that this is an unidentified animal that we know nothing of, and it seems to be related to what we would call a mermaid. What about unicorns? Nicole wants to know about unicorns. Yeah, well, unicorns are these, these very interesting creatures as well, too. Um, if you would look at the historical record, uh, the Greeks talked about unicorns, the Romans talked about unicorns. They usually placed them in exotic places like India because you know very little was known ab about India. Alexander the Great um, uh, went in to conquer India. He wasn't able to do it. He ended up dying not too uh, long after. So um, India always had this kind kind of very uh, mystical appeal to it, this very exotic appeal. And not only uh, was this the realm of, of, uh, of unicorns, but this was also a place where dragons were said to live. This was a place of wild men. There was also supposed to be dog men that lived in certain areas of India. So really anything that was odd and unexplained would come from India. So some of our first reports come from the Indian subcontinent concerning uh, unicorns. Um, but when we think of unicorn, we almost, you know, always think of the way um, it appears in British folklore. You know, this um, this dazzling white horse, uh, sometimes seen with a, a goatee, um, this great, you know, uh, uh, majestic horn that grows off the center of its head. Uh, you know, it's only being able to tame by a virgin. And of course, we have the analogies to it being very Christ-like, that this is a pure animal, something out of the environment, something with Without sin, that um, that that evil was trying to conquer or to steal from, um, and to think that mermaid or that uh, mermaids, to think that unicorns existed in England, um, that's a little bit harder to swallow because you know, of course, the population, and everything. But but these stories, um, I was always taught in history that history does not exist in a vacuum. It always comes from something. There has to be some precedent for it. And to think that there was an animal out there uh, like a horse that, that had a horn um, and not like a rhinoceros or anything like that, even though there are some outlandish claims about these particular animals as well, too. The unicorn always has this this bit of mystique that sets it aside from everything else. It's never been vulgar like these other animals. It always been very, very majestic and very mystic at the same time, very magical. And I think that there is something to be said that at one time there was a creature like the the, the unicorn that did exist. Do you believe? Of course, it's not shown in the fossil record, you know. But uh, no, but uh, that's that's again where my romanticism comes into play. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. You know, we've never found a body of this. You know, and, and we think of this creature right. as mythical, much like the Pegasus. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, right. Um, and like if we would talk about dragons as well, too, um, we can probably assume that dragons, especially if you look at the, the Eastern uh, uh, mythology of the dragons, it probably came about that, you know, farmers were, were plowing up fields and came across teeth of dinosaurs or bones of dinosaurs and such. Um, but it's interesting because the, the, um, the, the British 
dragon or the western dragon um, almost always is seen, um, uh, you know, protecting some sort of gold. It's a very greedy animal that uh, protects gold and it has this uh, accumulation of wealth that it that it kind of, uh, you know, glowers over. Um, well, it's interesting because in Mongolia, we can find the protoceratops, these these skeletons of the protoceratops, um, because of the the way the, the that area is eroded. These things are often on the surface of the of the ground, very easily identified, and because of that particular geology, there are a lot of gold deposits. So sometimes people come across um, this this protoceratops that has a very beak like mouth structure. Um, and right. so in the mind, it's very easy to say, well, it has a beak, so it probably had wings like a bird, right. and it's over this gold. As you kind of put two and two together, and as it made its way um, to the West, it now becomes this dragon of mythology. Ron, I'm going to get you to hold on right there to, because we got to go oh, to break sure, here at the bottom sure. of the hour. More unicorns, fairies. And Megalodon coming up next on Spaced Out Radio with Ronald Murphy, the crypto guru. Sorry, buddy. That was my fault. I forgot to give you a time. Oh, that's good. That's my fault. I was on a roll there, man. That's you, were, okay. you, were, you were doing beautiful, man. You were doing beautiful. <laughs> you know? Oh, that's now, good stuff. Sometimes I get so excited about a subject, yeah. Oh, not you. Not you. <laughs> Yeah, I hope uh, that because I Brian and I have been working on this book now for a while. I wrote all my pieces. Um, if he gets off the plot, this could be a really interesting uh, uh, study on um, new world, and that's something that a lot of people don't really work on. Um, the idea of new world um, uh, uh, alien contact. I mean, ancient <clears throat> aliens came out, but it always focuses on the you know Egypt and things like that. And very few people look at like mound building cultures, and that's what we are looking at. And I really cannot wait for this out. Yeah, no kidding, man. No kidding. That's going to be good. When are you guys looking at getting that done? Well, um, it's it's already a fairly massive book, but as I said, all of my parts are written. Um, Brian has to go in and put his parts in there, which is basically linking up um, uh, Native American stories with other stories from around the world to show that there is a connection. So as soon as that guy gets his research done, it could be, I mean, it, it could be done in as little as a week and then we could get this sent out to the publisher, but uh, he just got to get on the ball. Now, of course, he's a busy guy and everything. He lives in New York City, but uh, yeah, I really cannot wait till it's done. So if you ever get a chance to talk to him, uh, I would definitely push that because this could really be one of those particular books that could make um, a big dent uh, in the way we look at ufology. He's scurrying. He's saying ASAP, ASAP. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, um, he has really done a lot of work in um, in, in looking at the idea of the Nephilim uh, and connecting that to New World mythology. Something that really it, it has been done, but it does not bring in the archaeological evidence like we're doing, and that's really what's going to be important. Because if you want to have this scrutinized from all different levels, you do have to have a scientific slant in it. So what we're presenting is saying, look, this is what the archaeological record shows. Shows. And it isn't it interesting that this kind of mimics what people have described as UFO contact throughout the ages? Well, we're going to find out, brother. We are going to fl- find out. Oh, yes, man. we are. Man, this is good stuff. Good stuff tonight with the guru. Good stuff with the I'm, guru. I'm excited, man. This is, but it's going so quick, man. It's going too quick. Yeah, no kidding, man. No kidding. Well, yeah, before long it will be all over. I'm just get, getting myself a beverage right now to keep the uh, the throat moist. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, again, yeah, I cannot believe it's already after one thirty in the morning. This is insane. I know. I know. I know. Have they given you any timeline of when you may go back to school this year? Uh, no, Pennsylvania has canceled the entire year. Really? Yeah, yeah. Pennsylvania. Yeah, Pennsylvania has canceled the entire year. Um, Colleges in Pennsylvania are now starting to cancel classes 
uh, in the uh, the fall of next year already. So uh, unless the government knows something that we don't know, um, yeah, this could be this could be a, a long drawn out process. No kidding. Yep. Yep. They canceled classes in colleges uh, for the summer. Uh, already around here. Um, I do a particular festival called the Twin Lakes Arts Festival that gets a quarter of a million people a year. They canceled that, and that's over 4th of July weekend. Really? Yep, yep, yep. So that's really far out. But yeah, I mean, this is the thing. And this, and I hope somebody, people buy my books tonight as well, too. Uh, and I'm sure they will, because they always do. But that's one of the things is that um, everybody in this business that you know, that lives off of conferences to sell things, we're, everything has been canceled, my friend. Everything. There is nothing out there for us right now. Everything is just being closed down. True. True. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it is something. And I'm talking about the, the big mega ones as well, too. Now, my fall is going to be very, very busy because – all these things have been pushed back now until the fall. So it's like I have something going on every single weekend uh, from September up until Christmas time. But uh, that doesn't help me out now. I mean, I've, I've, I spoke to Ken Gearhart. He's already like $10,000 in the hall. I was supposed to speak at a conference in England uh, two months ago, and that was canceled. So all these conferences that I was supposed to really kind of shine, this was supposed to be my year, yes. has all been pushed back. So this is really hurtful yeah i remember you say uh, you when we talked earlier this year uh as yep, brian says yep. ask the important question when is the nhl coming back i don't you know i don't know man i don't know trust me this is killing me absolutely killing me oh, yeah. you know what sucks is yeah. literally i haven't had cable in like four years since i moved up here we decided we didn't want to get cable mm -hmm. we don't watch a lot of tv but i was really missing hockey and football on, on. Sure. And so we get cable and literally a week later, the NHL cancels its season. I'm just like, mm -hmm. fuck my life. You know what I'm saying? I know. <laughs> you know. I mean, like, what, what else do you say on that? Well, that's right. Exactly. I mean, what else are you to say? This is ridiculous. Um, especially even with like my show coming yeah. out and I need normalcy to return. My son's a big baseball uh, fan. We've been waiting for baseball. Oh, yeah. I didn't see one so far that they've even canceled <coughs> little league around here. I know. So we it's have terrible. nothing going on. Love yeah. baseball. Love me some baseball. Okay. Uh, we're about 15 seconds away. Hey everybody. We want to remind you that the super chat is open. And if you don't mind a great way to support what we do is by spreading the word, spreading the love give it us a thumbs up and going to check out our website spacedoutradio.com join the space travelers for five bucks a month as well as you can do a little shopping at the sor vault here we go music's on guru all right awesome we passed the halfway point of spaced out radio tonight i am your host dave scott sitting in the captain's chair of sor headquarters thank you so much for joining us want to remind all of you that if you want to check out our free archives, you go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spaced where we have a plethora of features for you, like reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR news, why are you getting your horns up for the guitar god Ron Bubblefoot Thal, and so much more. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter for the show at Spaced Out Radio, along with my personal handle at Dave Scott SOR. The crypto guru Ronald Murphy is here tonight talking all things legendary and folklorish. His website, cryptoguru.net. You're going to love him. His books are all in major bookstores and online. Guru, right before the break, we were talking about unicorns. And a lot of people, t uh, when they think unicorns, they think of the narwhals. They think of rhinoceroses. You know, yet, if you go back in Greek mythology with the Pegasus, the unicorn, German mythology, it it's all around that Europe. European area. You know, I'm surprised if this creature actually did exist at one point, even if it was 100,000 years ago or 50,000 years ago, that we have never found a skeleton with it. That we've never found a skeleton. That's absolutely true. Uh, but we find, we do find a lot of skeletons of horses. I mean, that's something that's very, very common. 
And these things may have been in such high regard that, you know, the, the, the horn was removed by people that found them or the often happens in nature as well too that uh, certain body parts are are eaten um you know it, it's very possible that if this creature was a flesh and blood animal that that was just something that was very, that was naturally taken away from it very very possible but um that's not to say that they didn't exist i mean there's there's dinosaurs out there that are being encountered that be, that are being found new dinosaurs that are being found every year so to say that we might have one day uncover a unicorn that's something to be said but um it's interesting the way you had talked about this too, because you know what happens if these things existed up until 200,000 years ago? Anatomically, modern humans have been around for 200,000 years, and we know that anatomically modern humans like to hunt, and it's very possible this is some sort of trophy that they were after, and we may have caused these things to go into extinct, especially if it was already a dwindling population by this time. We're talking about a time whenever ice sheets covered the vast majority of the world, and uh, we're talking about people that you know really had a hard scrabble life, and everything was fair game, and it's very possible that what we call the unicorn was, of course, admired by these people. They were seen as something magical and something um, supernatural, maybe some sort of connection with the gods because they appeared so differently. And they were, you know, unfortunately killed for that reason. And these certain body parts were used in ceremonial uh, as ceremonial objects and such. We do know uh, in the Middle Ages that people were able to buy unicorn horns. And, uh, you know, they assumed that these were narwhal horns. And and um, if we could find powdered unicorn horns called alicorn, that's what the powder was used that was used for uh, medicinal purposes was called. So we do know that there was a trade in unicorn parts in the Middle Ages. Now, again, was it narwhals or was people still, you know, going out and hunting the you know, the last few of these things that were still in existence? It's hard to say, but it's very possible that that's what was going on. Crypto guru Ronald Murphy is with us. Let's move on here. Renee down in New Zealand is saying, Guru, how about brownies, elves, trolls, and Dave's favorite gnomes? And I am one with the gnomes. Gnomes, that's right. (laughs) I am one with the gnomes. I know how you (laughs) So you have come over to the gnome side then. Is that what you're saying? I have. After my stern warning by our good friend David Weatherly about a year and a half ago, I am one with the gnomes. Okay, wait. See, I don't know the story, so you might have to give like a quick three-minute synopsis of okay, what happened. So, How did you go from your overriding fear of the gnome to now having acceptance for this creature? Well, David Weatherly sat me down when he was up here, and he's like, we have to have a little talk. And I said, okay. He goes, this whole thing where you're freaked out about gnomes, man, he goes, you got to stop that. He, and I kind of laughed, and he, goes, and he looked at me, and he kind of gave me that, that serious look. And he's like, he's like dude, I, I'm dead serious about this. He goes, I, and he started telling me this story about a friend of his who literally you know, hated gnomes. And the next thing you know, he watches a gnome steal his phone. While he's sitting on a, on the wow. embankment of a cr- of a creek, and so David was like, "Well, you have to go make an offering for this thing now." And so he brought him a gold bowl, and the phone came back. The bowl went with the gnome, and there you have it. And he said, "If you continue to put negative vibes and juju out there against the gnomes, they're going to turn on you, man. They're going to mess with your car. They're going to come into your studio and screw things up. He goes, you don't want to mess with them. They will always, always find a way, <laughs> you know? And so ever since then, man, I've been one with the gnomes, one with the gnomes. Well, well, that's great. And see how we bring all this stuff together in the course of our two and a half hours on air. Um, I talked earlier about having the synchronicity with the vibrational forces of nature, and that's basically what we're doing. That if we put toxicity into the environment, toxicity is re- uh, returned to us. And I think that there's a lot to be said about that. I think that we are all vibrational creatures. We're energy creatures, and everything around us is energy, and we can somehow manipulate our environment and, and by doing that kind of stuff. Now, the interesting thing about Gnome is whenever I talked about Paracelsus, and he had this whole idea of mermaids uh, being, you know, these protective spirits, this intelligent spirits of the water, um, he also said that the protective spirits of the earth were the gnomes. And the same guy 
that named the the uh, mineral zinc. So if you take a vitamin and you take it and it has zinc in it, our friend Paracelsus gave the name zinc to that particular mineral. And he also gave us the name gnome, which probably comes from some sort of German word that means of the earth. But um, yeah, so the idea of the gnome being this this elemental pr- protector of the, the earth, the same way the mermaid is the element mental protector of the water, um, that all comes from that same type of source. Um, and now now the person from New Zealand, what was her name again? Renee. Renee. Okay, so Renee uh, brought up a, a lot of different things, like, for instance, the, uh, the brownie. That is a particular fairy that usually deals with some sort of habitation. Um, it deals with a particular house, a particular farm. It has a particular habitat in, 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 a, in a place. Um, so, you know, if you have a house spirit, uh, that is sometimes seen as a gnome. Uh, an interesting thing is sometimes gnomes uh, were, were feared more than ghosts. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis, um, you know, the writer from the Chronicles of Narnia, said that he actually visited a home that was haunted by, um, by a brownie. So, um, yeah, a lot of folklore we see that what people would now consider ghosts, people thought were actually fairies uh, interacting, you know, to cause poltergeist activities, things moving around, or things missing, like you had said, taking things and hiding things. And that can be attributed to, to a brownie. Now, the interesting thing of, of a brownie is that usually they're helpful spirits, or at least they're indifferent. Uh, they live alongside us, uh, and it's not until we want to have some sort of contact with them, or sometimes w- one of the big things, especially in the Middle Ages, is if you would leave clothes for them, because oftentimes they went around naked. So if we would try to civilize them by leaving clothes, they would either be very, very mean to you, or they would just simply get up and leave. But if you would let them go about their little daily lives and do their things. Gnomes were sometimes beneficial for you, but usually they were never very uh, 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 malevolent in any way. Um, But yeah, that's the idea of fairy. I mean, these are all part of this fairy realm that is so vast and ubiquitous that you have different names for for different fairies by where they they have it, you know, the particular place they have it, uh, have their habitat. So when we talk about gnomes, these are definitely things that you know usually live underground, um, and they are, you know, for for all uh, you know uh, intents and purposes, these are creatures that were beneficial to us. All right. That's why I have them in my garden, you know, my, my little gnome statues. I have gnomes in the studio now. Excellent, excellent. That's how much the I stepped The same way up. they will help your garden grow. Yes. The same way they'll help your garden grow, the same way that they will increase your listenership with Space Out Radio. That's what happens. That's what I'm planning on. That's what I'm planning on. I love me the gnomes. <laughs> love me the gnomes. All right. That's this... right. you got to love me the gnomes. And they have beards. They have great beards. Fantastic beards. Fantastic beards. <laughs> All right, this leads to Nicole's question, and she is asking, what's up with the mushroom rings and fairies, doorway markers, party furniture? You're the man to ask. <laughs> well, um, the fairy rings is an interesting thing, and if anybody wants to read um, a history of, of fairies uh, throughout the world, they can buy my book that was just released last year called On Fairies. Uh, it's a very interesting study, and I have a whole uh, chapter in there on fairy rings. And they seem to act as portals uh, to another world, the, the fairy realm, if you will. Um, and uh, so in these circular um, images, uh, you know, you see the fairy rings is very circular. What Brian and I are working on our book about these portals, uh, they're always shown as circular objects. Um, and it's very possible that what we talk about with fairy rings was a way, what, what was, was an entry point. Uh, to another realm, the fairy realm. Um, I think that's very interesting. Uh, It's a very ancient thing, and it's also shown 
in um, uh, cultures around the world. So the fairy ring is something that you wanted to avoid because um, some beliefs were that if you stepped into the fairy ring, you would be taken to the fairy realm for sometimes seven years in a day and then be released, or sometimes you would step into a fairy ring and never be seen again. So that's that's the that's the very scary thing about uh, the idea of fairies. That sometimes, uh, you know, even though you want to interact with these things because you can hear this beautiful music, and uh, you know, you want to dance along and such, sometimes they will suck you into their world, and uh, then it's a very difficult uh, place to escape from. Hmm. So do you believe that, you know, we set these places up, fairy gardens with little houses, little doors and places, do we set them up to create that p- peace or are we doing it just because it's the thing to do? Well, it, we're doing it because, this is a great question. We're doing it because it's interesting, but I do believe in the idea of portals that a portal a portal can be a naturally occurring thing or it could be something that would be set up with intentions as well that you can put up something and things can pass through almost like a Ouija board you are making a connection with another world that we know very very little about the idea of putting like a little fairy door out in your garden is allowing certain elements to go from one world to the other if that is the intended purpose of what you're doing it for. So if you want to commune with the 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 unknown, this is one of the ways to do it. But you just have to be very careful about what you're doing because you really don't know what might slide through that door. I mean, you want to have these nice little garden pixies to help your flowers grow, but you also don't know what other kind of spirits might come through that doorway as well. Right. Right. So do you, when you uh, take a look at that and you're setting this up, do you set them up closer to your home, further away from your home? Do you want that interaction? Well, I I particularly do uh, because I go about it in a, a very um, a studious way. Um, there are plenty of uh, uh, things to research out there what particular plants are suitable, like thyme, for instance. The herb thyme is something that will attract fairies to your garden and usually beneficial fairies. But the idea that fairies are both light and dark fairies is is in existence as well, too. Not all fairies are fantastic little beings. Some things you don't want around you. So you have to know what you're trying to summon into your garden or into your life. Um, so that's that's the big thing, because there are some fairies out there that are not only, um, you know, very, very malignant, they have also been known to kill people. I mean, there are, there are stories throughout the Middle Ages uh, for this one particular fairy uh, called the Red Cap, that its cap is red because every time it kills a person, it dips its hat in, its, in, in, in the fallen victim's blood, so it's perpetually dyed red. These things you don't want to call out. But uh, yeah, there, like I said, there's, there's two different types of fairies that have been classified either as fairies of light or fairies of, of the darkness, or dusky fairies, as they were called. And you want to be very careful about what you, what you summon. So one of the ways to do that is putting particular plants together that have more beneficial fairies attached to them. Very light kind of plants, um, like marigolds, uh, certain types of herbs, like St. John's wort, or, and there are, are, you know, according to the uh, uh, medieval, uh, you know, uh, medicinaries, that there are plants out there that will actually protect you from bad fairies, like St. John's wort, or lavender, and garlic, and things like that that you can put in your garden to kind of ward off any kind kind of um, unwanted presences. So if you do want to have a fairy garden, I have a fairy garden, just be careful what you plant and what you want around your house. Good advice from the crypto guru. If you want to keep the fairies, gnomes, and sprites away, (laughs) definitely. Oh, my goodness. I don't know why that just made me laugh. But, I mean, like there just isn't a spray (laughs) bottle or something like that that we can use? 
You know, <laughs> that would be interesting. Almost like something you spray at a cat to get away. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, and this was something that people actually took into consideration uh, whenever they were putting in gardens. Look, and this is not all ancient history. We talk a lot about the Middle Ages because this is whenever people were really putting together things in books and in, 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 you know, in, in herbal books and things to talk about ways to, to prevent evil things that coming in. But in, even in colonial America, I know that up in Massachusetts, that certain types of the year, um, the farmers would open up their, uh, their, their uh, pasture uh, gates to allow the bad energies out <laughs> and the good energies in. So this is right. an all agent history. A, right. a lot of people have thought about this up until maybe a hundred years ago. All right. I got a question coming from Justin. He says, my wife believes I need to chop down our holly tree because negative fairies like thorns and red berries. Ron, do you have any insight on this? Okay. This, these are, these are some good points. Okay. So, um, the holly berry, no, a hawthorn tree, you never cut down. If you you come across a hawthorn tree or a weeping willow, please do not cut these things down. These things are called, you know, considered sacred to fairies. But if you have a child that has been abducted by a fairy, one of the ways to get it out of the fairy realm is to find a fairy mound, which is a telltale sign where fairies live underground. Take a hawthorn tree and burn it up on top of the fairy mound, and your child that has been absconded by these creatures will be returned to you. But if, look, I am not a big proponent on cutting down anything. Um, and I know in places like Iceland, they will actually um, circumvent uh, uh, highways so you don't go into areas where elves were considered uh, to have their habitats. Um, people have always, you know, let, you know, large trees go unmolested because they believe the spirits inhabited those particular places. So, look, Justin, I, I would just tell your wife that um, I, I would have no fear of any kind of malignant fairy being in your holly tree. What I would have a fear out uh, is that there might be fairies that do exist in that particular area. And if you cut down that tree, it may make it even worse because they're going to seek some sort of retribution for cutting it down. Yeah, you don't want to be doing that. You definitely don't want to be doing no, that. No, you don't want to be doing that. No, no, but I mean, a lot of these things come from, uh, you know, English, England, um, or, you know, in Ireland or Germany and, and places like that in the Middle Ages. So we have the ideas of hawthorn trees and rowan trees and oak trees and weeping willows. These are all trees that were believed to be conduits conduits to the other side. And these are trees that you should never cut down. Um, and, you know, in this kind of new age view and this whole kind of tree hugger view, it, it's usually better not to cut things down if you can help it. I mean, the, why would you want to cut that down? If the sole reason to cut it down is because you don't want to have negative fairies around, that's the wrong way to do it. Because if you do have fairy activity in your area and they are attached to this tree, positive energies can become very negative very quickly if you take something away from them. All right. We've got about two and a half minutes here before we got to go to break. At the top of the hour, the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, is our guest tonight. I want to switch topics here because Nicole here, she's just bought her first house. All right. Okay. Single mom, works hard, decides to buy a house next to a cemetery, mm -hmm. an old cemetery, man. Right. What should she be doing? Okay. She wants to know what should she be doing to prepare for this before she moves in? We'll talk about this. I can't. I cannot wait. It, it, tell her to stay on the line because, or st you know, stay in the chat room because there's a few questions I have to ask her. All right, I will do that. And uh, you know, uh, well, give us a little hint. Is it is it much more than just sage and Palo Santo wood? Well, I, I would not. Uh, first of all, uh, cemeteries being haunted is very, very rare. Even throughout time immemorial, very rarely do you have cemeteries are haunted uh, because that is the repose for the dead. You, you see what I mean? Very few places are inhabited by spirits where the bodies are buried. They're usually attached 
to a dwelling place. They're not not a cemetery. So you really don't have to worry about ghosts coming from a cemetery because that's a rarity. What my concern is, she's a single mom. I would ask if she has a, happened to have a daughter and if that daughter is, you know, around 12 or 13 years of age because – Strange things can happen with kids of that age. And so if she thinks that there might be a ghost there, this might be a manifestation of her child's um, untapped uh, uh, psychic abilities that will show itself in telekinesis. Yeah, she has a son who is younger than that. I'm not going to give his age, but uh, he's, good, he's good. younger. You don't have to worry about that then. Yeah, predominantly this is women. Like if you look at the Enfield haunting in England, usually these kind of uh, very uh, powerful hauntings are attached to uh, prepubescent or early adolescent girls who are seemingly able to manifest something uh, psychically because they're going through this, this kind of storm of hormones and it just kind of flows out in some sort of uh, uh, psychic ability. That really is uh, what I would like to point out. But I've always wanted to have a house that is very close proximity to a cemetery because um, very rare that there is haunting associated with the cemetery. I mean, it does happen, right. but for the most part, that's a rarity in the field of, uh, of ghost hunting. Awesome. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more here when we come back from break. And when we come back as well, Ron, I want to ask you about Megalodon. All right. Captain, oh, yes. Captain Kirk in yes. one of our chat rooms wants to know about Megalodon. And I do too, you know. And we'll see what else we can jam in here. So we got the Crypto Guru for another 30 minutes on here on Spaced Out Radio in Hour 3, along with the SOR Newswire and the Thought of the Day. Stay tuned. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. Oh, that was good pregnant pausing there, Dave. Good pregnant pausing. That's high quality (laughs) radio right there. (laughs) <laughs> that is something that's right that's right look we are almost over we probably will be able to talk about the megalodon like this just flew by so yeah Tell me about it. I, I cannot wait yeah because i'm not going to be going back to work anytime soon um if we want to plan out something in may i have no problem sure. doing that well but i know that you're probably getting pretty well uh, booked Ju- up, but may, yeah. may is booked but uh let me run my dogs outside and i'll uh, give you some dates in june here can't wait I'll be right back. 2019 sure. at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month. And follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! Poor little boy. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just five bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacy Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend. Woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights right here at spacedoutradio.com. Oh, what's this show? We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world. 
relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Hey, space travelers. This is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's west coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the Moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the Moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Hello, everyone. This All right, Ryan Guru, Station. I am back. Tracer. We've got three and a half minutes, Excellent. buddy. <clears throat> nice. And we, when we get back in there, we'll have like 20 minutes. I, I, again, I, I cannot believe how quick did this one. Now, what were some of the dates you had then in June? I got uh, June 1st, 3rd, and 4th available. 8th, 9th, 11th, 15, 16, 18, 19. So it starts off on a uh, Monday. What, um, what what date what what day okay, of the week but, is better? Uh, what's the fourth? Is that a Thursday? Yeah. Yeah, let's go with the fourth. Okay. Corinne, you got. Yep, uh, hold on, I got. Uh, if Corey's there, uh, we booked uh, the guru for the fourth. I got you on the calendar, man. I got you on the calendar. Excellent. I cannot. <clears throat> perfect. Perfect. I cannot wait. Me either, man. Me either. It's going to be a lot of fun. We get more guru time. Yeah. We get more guru I, I time. I cannot wait. Yeah, man. And then hopefully uh, uh, we can have that other book out. Brian and I can have that other book out. And we could be on sometime then, uh, you know, in, in July, because I would hope that it will be out by then. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh man, this is good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it would be so nice if that did happen because, like I said, I would I would like to have the premiere uh, on Space Out Radio. That would mean a lot to me. So hopefully that uh, you know uh, that he can uh, get this done quickly. So this will be good. Yeah. No kidding, man. No kidding. Let's uh, see if we can get it done. See if we can get it done, my friend. Yep. We can uh, definitely do that. Definitely do that. Oh, yes, absolutely. All right. We've got about 45 seconds left. All righty. For sure. For sure, man. Yeah, I just got my little sleeping dog here, and uh, uh, Julie came downstairs for the last part of this, so this is good. All the kids are sleeping. Now, without any kind of uh, uh, schedule, these kids have been going to bed at like sometimes 1 o'clock in the morning, but tonight they did pretty well. Oh, yeah, I know that feeling. I know that feeling all too well. Uh, one sec here. Yeah, Corey, June 4th, that's a Thursday. Uh, the guru is going to come back on. So, uh, yeah, there we go. We got the 4th. All right, uh, guru, Excellent. we got uh, about Perfect. 8 seconds here, so bear with me. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you to everybody who's tuning in on YouTube tonight. Really appreciate it. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up, everyone. Here comes hour three. Would you like to connect with us? Head to MusicsOnRadio.com for all your latest show info. Now back to Dave Scott and SOR. 
Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for tuning us on in, especially if you're listening in on one of our terrestrial radio stations across North America, on the digital side, on TalkStream Live and Revolution Radio. Remember, you can check out all of our archives for free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Jack Detation. Jack Detation is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We've got a plethora of features for you to check on out, including our music man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire and much more. Don't forget, follow us on Twitter at Space Out Radio for the show, and my personal handle, at Dave Scott SOR. For the final time tonight, we introduce Ronald Murphy, the crypto guru, and right before the break, Ron, we were talking about Nicole, who's purchased a house next door to a cemetery. She has said that it's a two-part cemetery. One side is of the Catholic faith. The other side is Native American. And it's kind of interesting because that is two way separate denominations of people. What do you think about that? It is. It is. Um, is, is. Is she in Canada? No, she's in Illinois. Oh, right. Okay. Well, um, I would think then if it was in Illinois that um, the the Catholic side, of course, you know, the, the Catholics like to keep everything separate because very near to where I live, there's a cemetery that is Catholic and Protestant. Now, the Native American section that would, would I would, would gather would probably be, you know, uh, much newer in history. I would think that it would just be set aside just because of the affiliation with a particular tribe. Now, there are places, especially places that were pre uh, French and Indian War, that had um, cemeteries with Indians that were attempted to be, you know, of course, evangelized by, by, by Christians. And there were sometimes problems associated with that because there was turmoil that occurred during those particular burials. And sometimes the ones that I've researched, uh, there are sometimes spirits that are not resting easy because of that fact that they were forcibly uh, assimilated. But I would assume that that particular cemetery um, has um, uh, a separation due to the fact that there probably is a, 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 um, a tribal affiliation. There might even possibly be um, some sort of reservation very nearby. Those are things that I would look at, but I would think that I would be able to sleep fairly easily if I had a uh, cemetery in my backyard. Now, of course, you'd have to look at how old the house is, uh, what kind of history is associated with a particular land around there, and if there is um, a reservation nearby, uh, what kind of possible, uh, you know, uh, feuds were fought in that particular area as well, too. A lot of stuff goes into what makes a haunting. Um, it's usually a sudden death or an uneasy death of some kind. Still will not allow um, uh, these, these particular souls to sleep. And if they're going to be in constant turmoil, even on the other side, that something will have to be done to set their souls at rest. But I would think in her particular uh, situation, that there's probably none of that. But I would say to do some research, find out what the oldest grave is in that cemetery, and then you can take it from there. But And, and if she has a, a son who's not, uh, you know, uh, at that particular age, like I said, if she would have had a daughter uh, that was around 12 or 13 years old, I would think that that might be something out of the door. But I think that she's going to be just fine. I think that she, sh she should enjoy her house and uh, leave out some uh, little gifts for the fairies in the area. All right. She says that there are native bounds everywhere all over the area and she's asking and this will be the final question because i want to get into uh megalodon here she's asking do you think okay. the obelisks in the cemetery can be used to channel or harness energies 
Oh, see, um, now, of course, whenever they made those obelisks, they were hearkening back to uh, this, this, this Egyptian way of thinking. A lot of this stuff is common from the 1920s, whenever Howard Carter went into Egypt and, uh, and excavated the uh, King Tut's, uh, uh, you know, his, his sarcophagus. So a lot of that has to do with that. That's a very Art Deco thing as well, too. Um, but um, it's, it's possible. Now, it's interesting that she said about the mounds as well. Because uh, the, when I had spoken to you earlier about Brian and I putting together a book about um, uh, the mound builders in, in early North America. Um, now, that is something completely different. If there are mounds in the area, sometimes these mounds seem to act, act as doorways or vortexes to another world or to allow certain energies to come through. <laughs> now, that is something completely different. Um, I would like to know, I mean, and she can get in contact with me as well, too. Uh, actually, any of your listeners can get in contact with me by going to Inside the Goblin Universe. Um, at uh, uh, gmail.com, inside the gobble of the universe at gmail.com, and I'll follow up with her. But if uh, I would, I would question how close there is uh, in a mound uh, to her particular location, and if there happens to be any effigy mounds in the area, because I know that there's uh, uh, quite a few effigy mounds in Illinois. So if she wants to get in touch with me at inside the gobble of the universe at gmail.com, tell her that she's free to do, and I, I talked with her at length over this. All right, we will do that. Megalodon, we've had some questions oh, yes. about that. And, you know, there's that famous World War II photo that some say is debunked of the submarine with a photo in the background of a, uh, in a photo, with a, in the background of that submarine is this fin and this tail fin or dorsal fin and tail fin, you know, and there's much speculation as to whether or not that was photoshopped. And, and you know, some people believe it is. Some people believe it is not. You know, out of any cryptid creature out there that I truly, truly believe exists outside of Bigfoot, because I've seen Bigfoot, would be the Megalodon. You know, every now and again, we get these, these, sharks or whales that are found with impossible sized bites out of them and you know we rack it up to a great white shark but then we you know by looking at the size of the of the bite you're not looking at a 15 foot great white you're looking at something that's you know 20 to 40 feet long which is almost in that megalodon you know baby megalodon type of size What's the chances that mm -hmm. this creature has survived? Well, first of all, I think that you made a, a lot of good points. Um, you have instances where great white sharks, apex predators, have washed ashore that were bitten in half by something much larger than them. Um, I think there is enough circumstantial evidence to suggest that somewhere out there, there may be a Megalodon. This is one of my favorite cryptids as well, too. Um, if I could choose any place, I think that people would find this surprising. If I could choose any place to devote research into the study of cryptids, it would be the oceans. Uh, not, not so much the woods for Bigfoot and such, but I'm more in interested in what's the oceans. And to think that a Megalodon is still in existence, I think that that's extremely plausible. Science will say that they vanished from the fossil record at about uh, uh, two million years ago. And that may be true, but just because they disappeared from the fossil record didn't mean they were still not in existence. Now, we are still finding to this day plenty of megalodon teeth, plenty of megalodon teeth, and some of them are in pretty good condition. Um, now, I'm, I'm not saying that we're finding pristine modern megalodon teeth, but that's, that's, that's a possibility as well, too. Um, but it seems that there were so many teeth of these creatures out there, which meant that there was a lot of them. The oceans were so vast, why couldn't a remnant population of the megalodon exist? Um, they would not be creatures, and especially that size, would not be creatures that would come very close to shore. These would be creatures of the pelagic oceans, the, the open water oceans, and we may, may very rarely ever come into their, their territory or their habitat. But I would think that a creature like that, you know, a school bus size shark that is out there, 
easily, easily conciliable in the vastness of the oceans, would easily be able to have enough things to prey upon. Um, and that we would, couldn't talk about a sizable population of these creatures, but a breeding population of maybe 800 to 1,000 around the world is an extreme possibility. And you would never or very rarely ever cross paths with these creatures. Um, the Megalodon has always interested me since I've been a kid, ever since Jaws came out, because, you know, Jaws always had a little bit of a wink towards this might not be an actual great white. This might actually be, you know, a, a Megalodon, very possible. And, of course, uh, on our radio show, Inside the Goblin Universe, Brian and I um, interviewed um, Steve Alden, who wrote The Meg. And if you would read The Meg, I mean, there's a lot of scientific research that goes into that, although he saw the Meg, the Megalodon as something that uh, exists in the vast depths of the ocean. I don't see it that way. I don't think that was a uh, you know uh, an abyssal creature. I think this is something that existed uh, higher up in the uh, in the ocean strata. But um, I mean, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that these things are still out there, and I, I I see no reason why not to think that they are out there. They definitely appeared in the fossil record. We know for a fact that they existed as physical forms. So there's no reason to say that they cannot still be out there somewhere in the ocean. Look, we're talking about the ocean that goes to seven mile depths in some places. And we're talking about a volume of water where they can inhabit so many different uh, stratifications of that water. Of course, there could be something out there like that still in existence. Of course. Where do you think it is? Do you think it's just swimming the oceans? Uh, do you think it's in the in the deeper waters of the Atlantic and Pacific? Well, I think that it would probably mimic the habitat of the great white shark, so it would follow. I mean, great whites will go from the Atlantic into the Pacific. I mean, they have such a, a wide range of travel, and there's nothing to say that these creatures just don't simply go up and down uh, continental shelves. There's no reason to say that that doesn't happen. So if there's only a 1,000 of these animals out there covering all the continents, probably warmer waters, then of course they could stay hidden, and they have vast amounts of territory to cover. All right. So, you know, if we are having these and we see it in the news maybe once, maybe twice a year, if we're lucky, of these pictures and videos of whales and other great white sharks with these massive, massive bites out of them. And when they measure those bites, those bites literally have the jawline that that is larger than any known great white shark. And we always just leave the topic at that. We never seem to get into the depths of it, of what could actually be making that bite. I mean, it's happened in right. Australia. It's happened off the eastern coast of the United States. You know, and, and it just doesn't make sense to me as to why we don't, we don't look at these subjects and say, look, Science says that the megalodon no longer exists. Maybe it's not megalodon, but maybe there is a larger species of great white shark out there that could be manhandling some of these creatures. That's all I know. Right. And and yeah, and the other thing that we're not taking into consideration too is the evolutionary factor of, of the megalodon as well. Um, it may not be the huge size that it once was. Two million years of natural selection may have taken it down vastly uh, because it doesn't have the kind of prey animals that it used to have. But that's not to say that there's not a supersized shark out there still preying upon apex predators. I mean, look, we question it, Dave. You and I in this field question it all the time. But what doesn't happen is science doesn't question it <coughs> because megalodons aren't supposed to exist. And because they're not supposed to exist to science, then that can't be. Do you see how that works? Right. Science will say immediately that there's not such a thing because it can't be. Now, we say, why can't it be? And that makes all the difference in the world. Science needs to start saying, hey, you know, why is this not possible? Instead of saying, oh, no, that, that, that's an impossibility because it's not based upon any kind of books. Uh, you know, it, it's not part of what we're digging up. It's not part of what we've discovered thus far. Well, I mean, you know, science is based upon discoveries all the time. And how many great finds do you think have been passed up because a scientist was an examining was examining it with a closed mind? 
that's what's sad about this whole mess. Yeah, and that's something that I'm still trying to figure out for myself, right? Because, the, the, you know, with great whites in there, there's there's and tiger sharks and bull sharks. There really is no need for Dave to ever go into into anything salt water, you know, because <laughs> I'm a right. meal. I'm a meal. Okay, and yep, I know if it's going to happen to anybody, it'll be me. I'm I've just learned from my past, huh. and you know, the little voice in my head says, "Don't bother, don't bother." But I mean, the idea that there is, you know, even a a twenty five to thirty five foot great white out there that is manhandling a lot of these creatures, it's scary. It is yep. it is very it, very it is. scary. I mean, Ron, you you look at it. We just a couple of years ago, scientists caught, I believe the name is Big Blue, of that uh, female great white shark that was measured to be around four tons, five tons, and she was yep. twenty feet yep. long. And you know that was the first time that they had ever captured a twenty foot great white shark on camera that close and personal. Right. And as far as we know, because we don't know the ocean that well, she may be average size compared to some that are out there. Exactly. That's absolutely the case. Um, And, you know, um, we we have attracting devices on that. So if you want to go to the the Internet machine, uh, you can track uh, Big Blue's progress around the world. You have no problem doing that. Um, Now, that, that is the thing. That is something that has been categorized, right? It's been cataloged. Um, but what about the Architeuthis, the great, the giant squid? You know, they, these things were called Kraken and North myth- mythology. We have um, woodcuts of these creatures uh, attacking wooden ships and pulling down masts. Um, and only recently uh, did the Japanese discover these creatures were not completely myth and legend. They were based upon an actual animal. You know, the giant squid does exist. We very rarely come in contact with it, but we know it's out there. That being said, why could not these giant sharks still be out there? Uh, sure, they might not be that that great size. Or like you had said, is it possible that great whites themselves can grow to massive sizes if they're left alone? These are all very pertinent questions that need to be answered. And I think that science has closed the book on that. Um, but you know, people like us are still having an open mind. But I think that great whites of even larger size may be out there. Uh, again, we're talking about vast oceans, and not only vast oceans, but there are also strange sharks out there, like the Greenland shark, that will exist under um, you know um, ice sheets up in the Arctic. So you know, we don't even know what's in those kind of cold water oceans. There could be a whole lot of weird things out there. The goblin shark was just discovered not too long ago and that's a fascinating animal as well you know they're saying that some of these sharks could be 300 years old um you know is it possible that you know a great white will continue to grow uh if left alone and can you know get to enormous sizes that we've never seen before well of course that's extremely possible actually it's not only possible i think it's very plausible um the same way with snakes although snakes freak me out but you know snakes will grow to a, to to incredible size if they're left to their own devices as well so we might think there are huge gigantic snakes out there yet to be uncovered as well yeah that's why dave won't go to the to the uh, beautiful areas and jungles of brazil because the anacondas there yeah no nope no, oh, no, not, not yeah. going there either. Yeah. No. Yeah, see, anacondas are like my, or, or giant snakes or any snakes of that. They're kind of like my gnomes were to you uh, before you had that newfound uh, respect for them. Um, I, I don't do snakes very well. I remember one time I took my kids out to a state park and there was still snow on the ground. And we, we uh, uh, sat down on a rock and looked at the water and I felt something on my hand and I looked down and a garter snake had obviously came up because my hand was warm and it um, kind of wrapped itself on my hand. Ooh, and no. I screamed like, a, nope. yeah, yeah, yeah. I screamed like a, a little girl um, and I, in my flailing of my arms, I tossed it into the water. Um, but yeah, you could imagine coming across a snake 20 or 30 foot long, but people reported seeing snakes, you know, 60, 70 feet long. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I don't do snakes very well at all. No, no, we're definitely not going down that road. Out of all the cryptids, as we only have less than two minutes left, Ron, I know it's flown on that, by. That's insane. Out of all insane. the cryptids yep. that you think are out there right now, 30 seconds or less, which one do you think we will prove the existence of first? Bigfoot, Megalodon, or Thylacine? Oh, the Thylacine. Actually, um, the last time I was on your show, I had reported that that was my prediction, that the Thylacine would be uncovered. Look, I think the governments um, uh, of, 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 of Australia, I think that they do know that that creature is still in existence. Um, it only became extinct officially, I believe it was like about 1926. So I think the Thylacine is still out there. Um, it's not been that long ago, and I think you still have a remnant population of them out there someplace. So I would put a lot of money on the thylacine, but I, I really think this might be something that's being covered up. I, I truly do. I think there's a lot of evidence coming out. Uh, people are seeing these. Naturalists are seeing these things. And for whatever reason, people are not um, uh, buying into it. Um, and, and I really don't understand that as, uh, at all. But the thylacine number one uh, and the megalodon number two, and I think our good friend Bigfoot is going to be elusive enough uh, to stay out of any kind of uh, category uh, for at least a while longer. I appreciate that. Crypto guru, always a pleasure to have you back on Spaced Out Radio, and we will talk to you again on Thursday, June 4th. I cannot wait, my friend. I'm looking forward to it, my friend. I, I cannot wait either. Uh, I, again, I, I've said this to you before. Uh, you have the best audience in the business. I've been on a lot of shows. Uh, I, you are by far my favorite. Uh, you. Your audience is my favorite. They're the most interactive people I've ever come across. Uh, enjoy the rest of your night, and I cannot wait until uh, June 4th. Awesome. The Crypto Guru, everybody, good friend of this show. We love him around here. You can pick up all of his books on Amazon or at any major bookstore. Check out his On series, On Witches, On Mermaids, On Bigfoot, so on, so forth. It's out there. Coming up next, we have the SOR Newswire and the Thought of the Day. More Spaced Out Radio coming up. Fantastic radio again, Guru. Fantastic radio hey, again. Thank you very much, my friend. <clears throat> we love thank you, man. Thank you very much. I'm, go I'm, going to, I'm going to get off here and uh, go to bed and uh, get up for my uh, my uh, conference call class tomorrow. Excellent. Uh, from 9 until 3.30. You know how much I'm looking forward to that. But, yeah, Dave, we'll talk to you very soon. Feel free to give me a call anytime, my friend. I will, brother. You take care, and uh, thank you for coming on, and we'll talk to you soon, okay? Yep, sure. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right, Guru. Good night. Guru time. Love me some guru time. All right. That uh, was a good show, everybody. That was a good show. We got some good news coming up here, too. So bear with me. Bear with me. I got to load this stuff up. Load this stuff up. Where are we here? Do, do, do. Thank God Captain Shirk takes good care of me. Seriously. Captain Shirk takes very good care of me when it comes to the news. All right, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. And let's continue right here. Oh, what's this one? I don't even know if we're going to use this one. Oh, we will. What the hell? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope you all enjoyed the guru. For many of you, that'll be your first chance at uh, at uh, um, hearing him. And uh, I'll tell you, the guru is awesome. Fantastic. Fantastic. We love the guru around here. And Ron is literally one of my very best friends in this field. And uh, we're so blessed to be able to have him come on in here um, on a on a very, very uh, nice basis. What the hell is going on here? Why are those not loading? Uh, we 
may not be using those ones. All right. <laughs> How many stories we got here? And these ones are not opening. Let's get rid of that one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, let's get rid of these. Because they are not loading. Let's try and load them this way. Well, let's see if this will load up here. That loaded. There we go. Now we're good. Now we is good for the news. There we go. There we go. Hey, Jasper, how you doing? Thank you for coming on in and uh, tuning us into Spaced Out Radio. Really appreciate you joining our chat room, man. And who else has popped in late here? <clears throat> Doo -doo. Yeah, I had a giant elephant seal with massive tusks pop up 10 feet in front of my face. Yeah, I'm not doing that, man. I'm not going, Fapster. I'll come hang out with you. We'll go to the bar afterwards, okay? And, uh, and uh, you know, we're that's it. I'm not going into the ocean, man. <laughs> no, Fucking way am I going into the ocean? No way. Hey, autopilot, how you doing? Uh, let's see, who else is coming in late here? Eh, Admiral Nelson. Davey, where have you been hiding, man? You're late, but that's okay. We love having you here. Oh, uh, let's see here. Who else? Who else is here? Uh, there's Davey. Um, we got about uh, just over a minute here. Yeah, apparently uh, FAP wants to see me eaten alive by going surfing in California. That ain't happening. That is so not happening, man. <clears throat> so not happening. Hey, watch out for Corins, either known as Quisates Hutterack. He controls my schedule, man. He controls my schedule. <laughs> Final commercial here. This makes things happen. Let's have a good round out sh to the show here. Oh. I got enough worrying about bears and cougars and giant moose here than to worry about going down also the ocean and have some God. sharks feeding Make sure you keep on listening because with Space no Star Radio, you know Little Brother is watching. All right, here we go. Here we go. Besides, my knees are so bad, I don't think I could get up on a surfboard. And one of those paddleboard things, sharks will take that down too. We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, hanging out with all of you tonight. What a pleasure it is. 
an honor as well. Thank you so much for tuning us in. I want to remind all of you that if you miss most of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. The only thing I ask in return is hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter as well, at Spaced Out Radio for the show, and my personal handle, at Dave Scott SOR. Speaking of the news, let's get to it, shall we? Bumblefoot? The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire, the back end of every show where we get into the weird, the strange, and the WTF with Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. And let's kick things off in Indonesia. Oh, this is a paranormal investigator's dream. If the threat of a global coronavirus pandemic isn't enough to keep some people indoors, what about the threat of being locked up with ghosts in a haunted house? Now, if you're like me, you're screaming, oh, heck yes, let's do this thing. But in Indonesia, lawmakers have started confining quarantine violators to abandoned buildings on the island of Java, where local legends suggest the abodes might be haunted. It's part of a novel effort to motivate a superstitious population through the supernatural when scientific arguments fall short. Kuzdinar Untung Uni Sukawati. Regency head for Sragan issued the order earlier this week amid a surge in newcomers from the other lockdown parts of the country, including the capital city of Jakarta. The order was put in place amid concern that visitors to the island of Java were not self-isolating for 14 days upon their arrival. If they disobey self-isolation orders, several villages have asked for my permission to quarantine them in an abandoned elementary school or abandoned houses. Why? He says, I gave permission, if need be, they should be locked inside in a haunted house if necessary. But we'd still feed them and monitor them. Oh, well, that's nice. See, you get to ghost hunt and you get free food all at the same time. And I'm pretty sure in Indonesia, they do not eat breakfast for dinner. Anyway, she goes on to say, five people have already been quarantined in abandoned homes to date. If there's an empty and haunted house in the village... Put people in there and lock them up, Sukawati says. One long abandoned house in the rice fields of Plupa has been repurposed to house two people. The two residents were put into an empty and haunted house and then were locked from the outside. She added that if they could obey the rules, they wouldn't be spending their quarantine in a haunted house. Another abandoned home in the village of Sapat was filled with beds to house three new individuals. Henry Susanto, who was locked up at the home, says that he hasn't seen any ghosts yet, but whatever happens, happens. Lessons learned. Oh, I want to go to Indonesia now. All right. In Vernon, British Columbia, a strange footprint that is thought to be that of Bigfoot is getting some attention from wildlife experts. Sarah McCran was at Shoe Shop Falls near Lumbee this past Sunday when she noticed a large print in the dirt, which she recognized from previous encounters. This is not an animal print. I wouldn't say it's a man print either, McCran says. I have actually seen a Bigfoot before in 2018, and last summer I had a bunch of UFOs follow me back from the border, and I have plenty of those photos as well as they were on their way to Kelowna. But one wildlife expert locally is skeptical, of course, and says tracking involves having two or more prints, not just one. Just having a footprint is very difficult, said Pete Wise, owner of Wise Wildlife Control Services. Conservation Officer Tanner Beck questions the footprint as well. Hard to tell if it doesn't look like wildlife, suggesting it could be an old shoe print. Now, I'm looking at this print, okay, and I'm going to be honest with you. I think it's a shoe. I totally think it's a shoe. Now, I'm thinking if Bigfoot is old, probably went down to Walmart, picked up a pair of New Balance because 
nobody under the age of 55 wears New Balance shoes. And I think this is what it is. Now, I'm looking for the woo. I can see where she thinks there is toe prints in this, okay? But this totally looks like a shoe. I'm debunking this. I know, disappointing to the Twitter crowd. Sorry, Derek. Sorry, skeptic. Okay, but this is a shoe. Anyways, she says, I've spent, or Wise says, the, the, the skeptic says, I've spent my entire life in the bush. Who uh, He has been trapping since the 50s, has never seen anything resembling Bigfoot. I'm not saying it's not there. I've got buddies who swear they've seen him, but... What did you see? For him, seeing is believing. Whether the footprint really is that a Bigfoot or not, McCran hopes this topic is a nice distraction from all the coronavirus news that is getting us there. Thought it would lighten some moods. Yeah, there's the answer right there. Yeah, there's the answer right there. You didn't fool us, McCran. You didn't fool us. No way. The death toll is Canada's deadliest mass shooting is rising unfortunately it's now at 23 after police said that they had discovered the bodies of four more victims in one of their homes gabriel wartman a millionaire alcoholic whose denture business was shuttered by coronavirus was shot dead after a 12-hour killing and arson spree in nova scotia the 51 year old gunman's victims who were scattered across the eastern province include a 17 year old a mountie heidi stevenson a mother of two, an elementary school teacher, a nurse, a care assistant, a family of three, and a husband and wife who leave behind four children. Cops initially discovered 19 victims, but unfortunately, officers recovered four more bodies from some of the five properties Wartman burned to the ground during his rampage. It was also revealed that the gunman had an obsession with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, known as Mounties. This infatuation, which his school yearbook showed, spawned from an early age reportedly saw him collect a haul of Mountie gear, including decommissioned cop cars he snapped up at auction. Wartman delved into this trove of memorabilia to disguise as a police officer, pulling victims over for in his fake police vehicle before executing them point blank. Police sources have said that the first two victims were Wartman's ex-wife and her new boyfriend, but he then easily slaughtered at random by pretending to be a police officer. RCM P. Chief Superintendent Chris Leather says his ability to move around the province undetected was surely greatly benefited by the fact that he had a vehicle that looked identical in every way to a marked police car. Wartman is understood to have abandoned his fake cop car after he crashed it and resorted to stealing a vehicle from another motorist. The shooter's obsession with the Mounties was underscored by the shrine he had erected in his home in Port of Peak, an acquaintance said. Nathan Staples, who lives nearby in Great Village and was approached by Wartman a few months ago asking if he would sell his own decommissioned cop car. He was one of those freaky guys. He was really into police memorabilia. Yeah, unfortunately, this is not going to get prettier before it gets uglier. You know, sad, sad time. And we all give our thoughts and prayers to everybody in Nova Scotia at this time. Here's a strange one. Probably the greatest of all time, literally got in trouble in Tampa Bay. What do you mean? Tom Brady, famed quarterback, Hall of Famer, six-time Super Bowl champion, was asked to leave a park in Tampa that is closed because of the coronavirus pandemic after being found exercising alone by patrol staff. Yeah, the six-time Super Bowl winner who just signed with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in March after 20 years with the New England Patriots. Tampa Mayor Jane Castor said the quarterback was seen during a routine patrol of the park in Florida. A staff member saw an individual working out in one of our downtown parks. She went over to tell him it was closed, and it happened to be Tom Brady. Brady, of course, is one of the highest regarded greatest players of all time, having won the Super Bowl more times than any other player in 2002, 04, 05, 2015, 2017, and 2019. He has made a total of nine Super Bowl appearances and been named the championship's most valuable player four times. The city of Tampa messaged Brady on Twitter after Castor revealed the news during her daily coronavirus update. Sorry, Tom Brady, our Tampa Parks and Recreation team can't wait to welcome you and our entire community back with even bigger smiles. Until then, stay safe and stay home as much as you can to help flatten the curve. You gotta admit, should they have used the word flatten in that statement? 
You know, didn't Tom get in a little trouble for that, suspended by the NFL? I don't know. I wonder if he got a ticket or if they let him off with a warning. Had it been you and me, probably got a ticket. Not Tom Brady, though. I mean, he's only worth about $200 million. Uh, We'll just forgive that $80 ticket or whatever it is. Nevada's state governor, Steve Sisolak, has announced he's extending the closure of all schools until the end of the school year and is not close to relaxing restrictions aimed to stop the spread of coronavirus. The Democratic governor state and state experts said that Nevada would take a gradual approach at easing business closures and staying at home rules without giving any expected date for how soon that might occur. Sisolak also said that it was too soon to say whether schools would remain closed for the start of the new school year in fall. Nevada has had fewer cases and deaths than statistical models originally predicted, and they appear to be reaching a plateau. The number of people hospitalized with the disease has started to fall, Sisolak, an official said in a news conference, but the state still needs to see at least a two-week trend in drops in the number of cases and hospitalizations for the disease before the state could start to inch open some of the restrictions. Yeah, well, look at that. Look at that. Now, if you're a fan of military aircraft like I am, this is good news. Oh, it is good news. The famed A-10 Warhawk, or Warthog, pardon me. Why the hell did I just call it a Warthog or Warthog? It's a Warthog. Anyways, it literally started flying in the 1970s for the United States Air Force. Well, the U.S. Air Force has decided that the Warthog is so, so needed for close air support that the jet has been extended into service until 2040. The jet designated to dominate Cold War battlefields will still be flying 50 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. That's good news. The bad news, the service is downgrading the jet's missions from one flying over tank columns on the ground to bombing bandits and insurgents in lightly defended airspace. The Air Force says it plans to cut 44 jets from the A-10 standing fleet of 281 aircraft. The remaining 237 jets will fly on in seven squadrons split among three active duty, three National Guard, and one reserve squadron. Retiring a portion of the fleet will enable the service to fund upgrades designed to keep the A-10 flying much longer with much fewer planes and tap into the Air Force's new generation of networking and communication systems, boosting the airplane's overall usefulness on the digital battlefield. Oh, isn't that nice? In addition to the A-10s, the Air Force plans to cut 29 aerial refueling tankers, 24 C-130H transport aircraft, 24 global Global Hawk drones, and 17 B-1B Lancer bombers. All of the manned aircraft are older planes, particularly the aerial refueling tankers, some of which entered service in the 1950s. Older planes are typically more expensive to keep in service as sourcing spares and the lifespan of key parts becomes an issue. By retiring older planes, the Air Force hopes to free up funds to buy and support new planes. The A-10, however, is being kept on one condition, though. It is no longer designated to fly over heavily defended battlefields. The Air Force is convinced the aircraft designed to unleash missiles, rockets, bombs, and its beautiful GAU, or GAU-8-8, a 30mm Gatlin gun, is no longer able to fly over double-digit air defenses. These include SA-11 Buck surface-to-air missile systems. Oh, they're taking all the fun out of the aircraft. Yeah, apparently, you know, the... The F-35, the F-22 are going to take over those jobs. So either way, it's been a good run. Finally, finally, Greek police have seized 11 tons of antiseptic gel from a warehouse owned by a Roma mafia boss who sought to profit from the ongoing Wuhan coronavirus outbreak. Police found the medical equipment in a warehouse in Athens and reported it that it belongs to 40-year-old Dimitriou Seventinglou, also better known as his nickname, Sefkis. The police were able to confiscate the products, which were imported from Cyprus because the antiseptic hand gel had not been declared to the government as per Greece's emergency measures designed to combat the spread of Wuhan. Let's get to the thought of the day. 
It's a good clown tonight, Marty. Good clown tonight. Marty on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Thought of the Dave happens every night of this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages. Then read your responses on the air because we absolutely love the audience participation around here. Today's Thought of the Dave is as follows. What have you learned about yourself since being locked down? Darren, I've learned that home relaxing isn't relaxing for me at all. Sparky, I am happy I am a loner and I enjoy playing music, reading, working out, and starting a summer garden. Being locked down has not been difficult for me. I have a new appreciation for my personal type. Angie, I have found out that I really like whiskey. Oh, and that I need people. I need to go out and have coffee, go out for drinks, and just go hang out. Kevin, that my lifestyle drives others insane. Tina, that I am way too comfortable being myself. John, I understand those investigation discovery shows better now. Merle, nothing. I have been working the entire time, business as usual. Vanessa, I have found out that I am funny AF. Jeffrey, I have learned that Skinwalker Ranch is even more baffling than ever before, and that Carol Baskins fed her husband to tigers. <laughs> I refuse to watch that show. Refuse. Oh, man. Oob to Joe's Maine. Beautiful haired Joe in California. I have learned that my normal solitary lifestyle is actually a very rare skill. It appears to be driving most people to insanity when they first try it. Coral, I've developed a greater appreciation for friends and coworkers and miss human contact more than I thought I would. It's been a difficult go for me. Kayla, that I drink too much and I hate people because I am totally okay with being with myself. Eric Cooper from Forest Moon, well, Hell, since I don't go out much anyways, it's nothing new. It's the kids that are going stir-crazy. Olaf, I don't like being locked down. Gil, I've learned I'm more passionate about protecting my family. Brandy, I am capable of working the jobs of all of my employees. I am able of working 12 hours straight for seven days in a row. Laugh out loud. Lisa, even though I am an essential worker and do get to go to work, I did get to go out more than I thought. I do not handle stress as well as I thought I did. Barbara, I eat, drink, and smoke way too much and not exercising enough daily. Jim, I've been working from home for 10 years, so it is so normal. Much less stressful when you take out the commute and office politics. Nicole, I've been checking in with people I care about a lot more than I normally do. Kimberly, I'm lazy. William Pullen, great hair, fancy khakis. I have become even more aware that I am intolerant of charlatans and frauds or being attacked in any way. Amen, my friend. Amen. Bill, I really like being on the radio. Thanks again, Dave. No problem, Bill. Kusilis. Renee, what I have learned, I have learned that standing in line to do my grocery shopping is not a fun activity, but getting out is a real treat. I miss shopping at places that were forced to shut down like Kmart and the warehouse. Oh, that's nice. Aaron, that I'm not taking it as well as I thought I would. Let's go over to Twitter. Marty says, I've come to realize how much easier life can be without all those annoying, obnoxious people we are forced to interact with on a daily basis. By the way, here's your thought of the Dave Clown for tonight. Thank you, Marty. Anthony, I don't mind staying home at all. Ronnie, I like being introverted. Roy, I adapt better than I thought I would. Hitting the reset button and now on a great roll with my podcast and my brand now. Being home has taken creativity to a whole new level. Judith, more of an empath than I realize. Very hard to keep myself on an even keel. And Antisocial Moth states for the final one tonight. I learned having four dogs is better than being around most of society. And that's probably the best way to put it. Dogs are just way too good for us. They really are. Go rescue one. As soon as we're done. 
you know, with this whole coronavirus thing, go rescue an animal. It feels really, really good. Thank you to everybody participating in the Thought of the Day on Twitter and on Facebook. We'll do it all again tomorrow. Thank you to Captain Shirk for putting together a fantastic run for the SOR Newswire and to the crypto guru, Ronald Murphy, for coming on in, talking all things cryptid. Cryptoguru.net is his website. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is Watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everybody participating in our chat rooms tonight on YouTube, Spreaker, the Space Travelers Club on our website, Rev Radio, Facebook, LGAB, and all the snarkers and snarkettes hanging out on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. You know who you are. Yeah, it was a good night, wasn't it? I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your evening with us because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night, Mr. Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Have a great night, everybody. I hope to see you all again, listening in, tuning in, wherever you are on this beautiful planet, again tomorrow. Thank you so much for letting us entertain your needs for the woo each and every night. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. That's a good show, everyone. Good chatting. Solid chatting tonight. Clapping for all of you on, on the chat rooms. That's good. That's good work by you guys. Solid, solid chatting tonight, people. Solid chatting. Do, 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 do. Do 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 public profile well, that's not what we want. We want the dashboard. How are we all doing? We have a good night. Oob, Joe's main. Oob. We need a hair update, Joe. You haven't given us a hair update or a critter update. Critter report, pardon me. Need that. Need the critter report. Come on. Don't hold out on us. Don't hold up on us, man. Don't hold up on us. <laughs> I get to edit the show now. So awesome. So awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I love me some guru time, man. What update do you need? What update do you need, Audra? Okay, you talk about here at you. Update? What, what update do you need? I'm kind of lost here. Help me help you. Help me help you. Do, 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 do. What is Ace? What is this? <sighs> Tell you a funny story. <laughs> this one makes me laugh. Uh, quickly, because I, I honestly, I have to go to the bathroom. 
And anyways, so a couple of last week, there was this lady on Facebook. And during one of the breaks, I was updating, you know, my Facebook role to see if I was missing anything. And this lady who's on my friends list. Okay. And you have to realize I don't add very rarely. Do I add someone to my friends list? If I do, it's either someone I know or someone who's going to be a guest on the show. Long story short, uh, this lady whom is never, I I've never really recognized her name appearing on my, on my, uh, profile page. She, she goes, I can't sleep. Where is everybody? So I write a little snarky comment. Everybody's tuned into Spaced Out Radio tonight. You should come on in and listen with them. And she goes, who? What's that? And I typed in, ouch. And she goes, well, if I knew what it was, I would try and, you know, maybe check it out. And I just went up to the friends list and put the unfollow and unfriend mark right there because I don't understand why people add me. And and you guys are probably all the same when they have no clue on what they are doing. No clue on who you are, what you do, nothing. Let me just go like this and drag the audio over. All right, I'm going to hit the bathroom. I'll be right back. Right back. You guys don't go anywhere. I'll be back. I'll be right back. Be right back.
coming. I'm coming. All right, here I am. Here I am. I'm here. I'm here. Don't you worry. Don't you worry, everyone. David is here. David is here. How are we all doing tonight? Do you enjoy the crypto guru? I did. I did. Let's see. What is this about? Oh, that must be a commercial there. Let's cut that out. Let us. So for those of you who are wondering what the hell is Dave doing? Dave is now editing the show. So that way I can send it off to the radio stations and make it look pretty. It's good stuff, man. All right, Dave, you want to laugh? What happened to me? Because your show is... Uh, yeah, what happened to you, Jeannie? I want to know. I want to know... What are we talking about, blueberry? Oh, are we talking gelato? That's good. So anything blueberry is nice. Even the Gibson Les Paul blueberry paint job is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Blueberry vape? Oh, that sounds good. Not much of a vapor kind of guy. <laughs> Let's see here. Oh, we got to save that first. File, save as. What's the date today? 0421SOR1. THC vapes, Dave. Oh, 
Yeah, old Dave isn't doing that. Dave doesn't do that. I just get the natural high of just being me, man. Natural high of being me. How's that work? How's that working for you, Dave? Two million. Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Do, 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 do. One done and make sure that's in there. Yes, it is. And where am I here? Number two. What are we doing here? I swear I might be one of the only audience or people around SOR uh, with uh, connecting with you guys that literally has, uh, <laughs> does not smoke marijuana. You guys are a bunch of hippie lettuce, devils, lettuce smoking people. You crazy bastards. Crazy bastards. I love you the same, though. I love you the same. Hey, Fabster, thank you so much. Haven't you done enough this week, man? Haven't you done enough, bro? Seriously. Yes, but Dave, you should be taking CBD for your knees. Probably. Probably. But I love you all nonetheless. Not going to lie. You know, the one thing I do love, and I don't know why, I absolutely, uh, I absolutely love the smell of pot. I do. You know, it's just there's something about it that is just an absolute attractant. I don't know why, don't know what, but it is what it is. And uh, I have no problem being around it, that's for sure. I just don't like smoking it. Do you ever wonder? Do you ever wonder if uh, if people who tune in this show later on, if they tune in right to the end and they see us all kind of hanging out and reading the chat room, and because the chat room scrolls with them, and and you know they're wondering, well, what what the hell do they talk about for all these times, and what the hell are they talking about all of this, and what's this all about? Honestly, this is one of my favorite parts of doing the show. They're all sitting there. What the fuck is Dave doing? Seriously, what is he doing? I'm editing the radio show. That's what I am doing. That is what I am doing. Hey, Life Dweller, what's going on? Who wrote the book of love? Who wrote the book of love? That was a good song.
All right, let me scroll up to read. I was running down my hall. My PJs were falling off one leg out. And my husband said, what's wrong with you? Uh, oh, Jeannie's getting naked. This is pornographic here. Jeannie's a little pornographic here. Running down the hall and getting naked and... Oh my goodness, Jeannie. <laughs> oh my goodness. She's dropping out of her pants to let uh, listen to the show. How's that for woo, Derek? How's that for woo? Jeannie's getting naked to listen to the show. Woo! There we go. There. We <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. I got something, Derek, I'll be honest with you, man. I got something really, really weird, and I'm saving it for Friday night's roundtable. I am totally saving it for Friday night's roundtable, man. Um, I'm, I'm a little weirded out by something that has happened recently, and I know there is probably a very logical explanation to it. But I'm saving it for the round table because I know Giordano is going to go off on me about it. But it is it is good woo. <sighs> it is good good solid woo, man. Uh, one second here. Did I put five in there? Yeah. And, uh, I literally, literally, man, I, um, I was weirded out by it all last night and today again. I, I, I want to save it for, for Friday night. I want to save it for Friday night. All right. I will say this, okay? I will say this. I may have had a Mandela effect, and long story short, okay, I know we talk about the Mandela effect and everything on the show, and it's kind of one of those topics that we kind of have to touch because it is, it is out there, okay? It is out there, and, you know... Do I believe in it? Look, there's a number of these topics I don't believe, but we still touch them anyways. But I'm a little weirded out by this because I'm not sure if I had a misremember, a major misremember in my personal life recently, or if I had a Mandela effect. And I really do not know. And the idea behind that, too, is that there is witnesses with that. And I'm trying to debunk this because I do not, I do not want to believe that this was some sort of Mandela effect kind of, of stuff. Okay? It involves... I'll tell you the players. It involves myself. It involves Olaf Phillips, R. Keith Andrews. Okay. Uh, I got to talk to Eric Cooper about it yet because he was kind of involved. And I'm a little weirded out. I'm not going to lie. I am a little weirded out. Oh, I love working with Richie G. He is so talented.
Richie G is so talented, man. It's hard what Rich does. It is very hard what Rich does on a nightly basis, man. Really hard. And I don't think I could I could do what Rich does on a nightly basis. I really really do not believe that I could because it takes a real talent to be able to um do what Rich does as many episodes as he does with uh with uh without a guest and that is really really hard really hard and uh rich is extremely extremely good at what he does and um um he deserves a lot of credit and thousands upon thousands of more followers than what he already has. Seven oh six one four three. Uh, Nick, did you go to the Abbotsford Air Show much? Saw an Apache chopper there. Forget if it was there. Oh, there's been lots of A tens at the at the Abbotsford Air Show. I went from every air show from nineteen seventy six to 1995, 94, 95. And because I lived in Abbotsford, I was born and raised in Abbotsford. So um, probably the coolest experience I ever had was in 1991. My dad ran the pilot's bar as a volunteer. And... Um, and he um um and i got to watch um it was like on a sunday night pr the week previous to the air show and we got to watch um oh there was a bunch of russian jets that came in there were two mig 29s two su 27s um a MiG-31. That was the fighters. A couple of transport jets. And they were flown into Abbotsford at night by two F-15 Eagles from Elmendorf Air Force Base in Alaska and four CF-18 Hornets from... um Oh, what was the squadron? 441 Silver Fox. And... um the next day I got to go back to the airport after meeting the CF 18 pilots. And this one pilot, I only know his call sign was stitch. He actually, uh, sat me in his Hornet. And I literally, he told, taught me everything about that plane for the next like 45 minutes. It was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, I got to sit uh, in one of the F-15s and like I'm 18 years old and um, and going through this and it was phenomenal, phenomenal. Hey, Teresa. 
I like to have that guy Gary back. He was one about cleaning up pyramids, but then he found that old Hebrew writing next to the pyramid. He was contacted by aliens when he was in the water. Yeah, um, usually uh, we try to put some distance in between guests. Gary, what the hell is Gary's last name? You mean Robert Stanley? Robert Stanley? Is that who you're talking about when we were talking about with him on Friday, Teresa? Yeah, that Ramstein air show disaster was horrible. Oh, man. Uh, 441 was in Cold Lake at the time. And I believe they were staying at... Um, um, uh, I think they were staying at uh, in Comox at that time. Let's see how our transfer is doing here. We're at 55% there, and uh, we're at about 16 minutes left there. Isn't that nice? Yeah, isn't that nice? Good night, Renee. You have a good one. You have a good one. You know, I really thought with the Crypto Guru tonight, we'd hit that, uh, that 100 mark. I really did. I thought we would hit that 100 mark tonight. I guess we didn't, but that's okay. That's okay.
me one second here. Hello. Hello. When is the NFL draft? When is the NFL draft? I like watching the NFL draft. Well, it's scheduled to be held. Uh, April 23rd to 25th. Have you heard of uh, any skyquakes lately? No, I haven't. Never even heard of a skyquake. April 23rd. What is special about that day? I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't remember. I don't remember. Okay, what do we got here? SOR Vegas Getaway 2021. Absolutely, Shanna Banana. I'm going to be there. Are you? Yeah, what the hell is a skyquake? I gotta look this up. What is a skyquake? Skyquakes are unexplained reports of a phenomena that sounds like a cannon, trumpet, or sonic boom coming from the sky. Oh, that's kind of cool. I wonder how many skyquakes the SR-71 um actually had or caused that would be kind of cool to see hollow moon we can't even prove that earth is hollow how are we supposed to prove that the moon is hollow And Shanna Banana, I see what you did there on Twitter. Indonesia is missing out on the joy of breakfast for dinner. No way. They got it right over there. They got it right over there.
Teresa, do me a favor. Email Corey at bookings at spacedoutradio.net. Bookings at spacedoutradio.net. Mm-hmm. Has anybody seen that video of the rap song that they made up about uh, Kenneth Copeland, the COVID-19 one? God, that's hilarious. That is just hilarious. Love that stuff. Where he's like, COVID-19! COVID, and you hear his, like, his background dudes, COVID-19! Then COVID-19. Oh, yeah, it's frigging great. It's frigging great. Oh, by the way, for those keeping track at home, uh, more trolling comments by Peanut Butter Rolls in a different identity called J.C. Dova. J.C.D.O.V.A. Yes, we got an, caught him in on another one. More trolling comments. It's kind of funny. Kind of funny. We don't get a lot of rabbits around here. In the forest, you do. What's really weird about the rabbits up here is when it comes to f the rabbits uh, up here, they change color from dark brown to pure white when the first snowfall comes. And when that first snowfall melts and everything's back to that gloomy brownish yellow color, the rabbits are still bright white. And they have no choice but to stay white. They can't change back until the fall or the spring again so they are like major major uh pro <laughs> in major trouble for themselves with the predators because i mean when you see something white ghost white standing there in the bush you kind of know it's a rabbit it's kind of cool it's kind of cool feel sorry for the rabbits though because that first snowfall up here always screws everybody up jc dova D O V A. Where am I? COVID 19. I'll tell you. Kenneth Copeland looks like the fucking devil, to be honest with you. He looks like the devil. Uh, did you get an email back from Mr. Tenney? Shanna Banana, did you get that? We had a preacher asking people to donate their entire stimulus check to the church. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? What an asshole. What an asshole. And the worst part about it is they try and dignify that through the word of God, man. Honestly. That pisses me off. Shame on them. Shame on them for doing that. What do you guys think? Do you think Kim Jong-un has coronavirus? Apparently he had a surgery that went bad. What do you guys think? So you got the C?
There we go. We are emailed off. He has the fat, short, bad haircut virus. Who's that? PBR? You better not be talking about me that way, because I'm not bad haircut virus. I may be fat, I may be short, but I don't have bad haircut virus. Oh. Where'd that go? Where'd my elastic go? A little bit of mayhem never hurt anyone. There it is. Hmm. <sighs> I'm still trying to figure out who you guys are talking about. I missed something here. I should actually pay attention to this. Jehovah. All right. Um... Oh, Kim Jong-un. Well, PBR, Ch Kim Jong-un, same thing. I got nice hair tonight. Still smells shampooy clean. Uh, Kim Jong Un. Yeah, I wonder who takes over because he doesn't even have a kid. Uh, at least that we know of, or don't know of. <clears throat> well, I mean, don't forget, I mean, you're worth like $40 billion, but the chances are if uh, his brother, one of his brothers gets in there to take over because it is the family way, 
then um, there's a good chance that his wife and kid may be killed or whatever. Who knows? And when you live in North Korea, if you're the chosen one to be the bride, would you sooner be the bride or working in some prison camp? How about my favorite Kim Jong Un move? Remember when he um remember when he uh 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 remember his uncle was like one of the top generals and he thought his uncle was going to try and become traitorous, so he had his uncle uh tied up to a stake out in a tank field and then they fired artillery at him blowing him up that is just fantastic classic kim jong un classic Got to love him. God bless him. God bless him. That was a good move. I think Renee in New Zealand, now that she's single, she has a little bit of a crush on Kim Jong-un. Loves the hairstyle. You know, the flat mop on top. He killed off one of his brothers, but there was like two or three brothers. Hey, Stephen Edmund, have a good night, man. Hmm. What if we weird? <laughs> I hate this camera angle, by the way. Hate this camera angle. I got to figure something out here. I do. I have to figure something out here. Hate it. Dave, I just took a screenshot of you with your flowing locks. Grandma Rose will get it when she wakes up around 7. Oh, thanks, Fapster. Hey, send me a picture of Grandma Rose, man. Let's, uh, let's have a, some love with Grandma Rose. Good night, Shannon Banani. Well, I'm going to get going here too, guys, because I slept in an hour later than I was supposed to tonight and, or this morning, and I want to make sure I'm up. I got a bunch of work I need to do tomorrow and work on the Space Travelers Club and so on and so forth. So I appreciate uh, all of you guys uh, coming on in tonight. And I love you all, and I appreciate you guys taking your time to spend it all with us. So you guys have yourself a wonderful night. Thank you for supporting what we do on a nightly basis. You're all very awesome, very awesome. And uh, keep doing what you're doing because uh, it's pretty cool out there to be able to all come together the way we do on a nightly basis. Much love. Take care. 
and we'll talk to you tomorrow night. Our guest tomorrow night, Joni Mahan and Deanna Simpson. We're talking about Deanna Simpson's really, really brutally scary hauntings. It's going to be a great, great show.